Stop that. Stop that. Stop uh, that. Yeah, yeah. I hear him chat to the noise. Go too quick, can't stop for the talking. I hear him chat with the boys. Yeah. Just too sharp with the prize. White girls let it tell me I'm awesome. Yeah. Hot like fire on the pine. If you wanna touch my please use caution. Call like zero degree. I'm out the cage, gotta let out the beast. Revolutionary guy let out the streets. Locked in a cage, I'ma let out the let out the let out the let out the, let out the sheets. We can't go wrong now, forget my peace. You take the west, I'll take on the east. I'ma put him in a cage, never let out the let out the let out the yeah. I hear him chat to the noise. Move too quick, can't stop for the talking. I hear him chat with the boys. Not so tough, but man's keep walking, yeah. Just too sharp with the prize. Right girls, let it tell me I'm awesome, yeah. Hot like fire on the pan. If you wanna touch my feet. Stop that. Stop that. Stop that. I have mentioned that these grid of death punishments make doing the show more difficult, and the one I'm presently wearing <laughs> is difficult for a number of different reasons. Uh-huh. My mask is tight in all the wrong places. Mm. I have uh, hair underneath. I don't know that it's clear from what I'm wearing that I'm Nacho Libre because you're, evidently he usually didn't wear the mask. Mm -hmm. Uh, But also my nipples are showing. It is is really cold in here. And furthermore, uh, the pants are really tight in a way that's uncomfortable. And I don't want anyone to see what's going on down with the pants. Like, I'm going to have to conceal that throughout the show. And as an added bonus, I can't wear my glasses with a wrestler's mask on. So I can't read any of my notes or anything that I've that I've written down. But let's be honest. You love this. I mean, you do. You love it. Uh, Someone I, described you as giddy earlier yeah. when they saw you kind of prance you like to dress through the up. office yeah. to your studio. Uh, that is uh, falsehoods. Uh, like that is not it, it's not true in any way. There's not I, I I came through like you could have seen the shame on me covering my nipples with my hands. There there was no giddy on coming through here with this punishment. You honestly look fantastic. You do, you do. yeah. Surprisingly you, chiseled. I mean, I mean, seriously, yeah, yeah. Um, I can't stop looking. I want to take a consensus. I want to take a vote. Do you guys think Dan likes this? Like, rate show of hands for the people who think Dan uh, okay. does like this. Yes, let's do the joke of whether Dan gets annoyed or not by falsehoods. <laughs> That's not a joke we've ever done before. Let's do that one. I agree, though. With you look you. good, man. I agree that he uh, he rarely wears the mask, so I'm cool with you just being shirtless with the cape on. Well, the cape is also uncomfortable. The tassels fit in all the wrong spots. Does anyone know that with the mask? Does anyone? Anyone know that I obviously I'm going for wrestler, but can anyone tell that it's Nacho Libre or do I have to take the, the mask off? I think in it's order- the color scheme. I think if you've seen that color scheme before, I think you can get it. All right. I want to start, Stugatz, by talking about uh, the, the cool story last night from basketball. Because uh, Max Struess had a fourth, Schuster. a fourth quarter for all time. Yeah. He played five minutes, he made five threes, and he produced, uh, get that camera away from my nipples, please, it's a little too close. (laughs) Push that camera back. Yeah, it looks better far away. (laughs) Thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, Stugatz, there's a number of stuff that's great in this video. We will get to both the sad call and the happy call of this game. But, Let's just play for the audience that did not see this. Dallas is playing Cleveland, and P.J. Washington makes a surprisingly easy shot at the rim with two seconds left. And uh, let's not go to that one first. I want to show the whole shot before I show P.J. Washington because P.J. Washington's reaction is the funniest thing in this entire video. But I will tell you again, Max Struess last night was playing in a game, Cleveland and Dallas, and they're down 10. And in five minutes, he made five threes. Five fourth quarter minutes. He made he went five for five from three. He did it in like 45 seconds, the first four of them, because they were down 110 to 100. With three minutes and 42 seconds left, he hits the first three. Then after a turnover, another three. Then after a Kyrie three, another three. 
Then after another miss by Dallas, it's another three to get them within one, and then that three at the Stugatz, end. Stugatz, the scoring in this sport is so crazy. that What was it that Kevin Love did against the Sacramento Kings a couple of nights ago? Was it 19 points in 15 minutes or 19 Something points? Something like that, And yeah. seven rebounds in, in 15 minutes. So Struess makes five, Struess. five threes in the fourth quarter. And let's just play the ridiculousness of this last stretch here. Leave it to inbound, just to the left of the Cavs bench. All we need Leave is a deflection. Pass deflected by Mobley, but grabbed by Doncic. Doncic bounced underneath the PJ, and he laid it in with 2.6 to go. Cavs out of timeout. Struess into Mobley. Back to Max. Half court shot. Good! Good! He hit it! Cavs win! This place is going crazy! The rest of this is just celebrating and stuff, and I want to get to the sad call in a second, but I believe the funniest part of this is the reaction of P.J. Washington. Again, there's chaos with two seconds left. You never get the shot that Doncic got P.J. Washington at the end of the game unless everyone scattered. So he makes it at the rim, and watch this. He's flexing the whole way. The whole way, he's flexing down the court. Game's over in his mind. He's he's flexing. He keeps flexing. Struess's shot goes up. He keeps flexing. And then left hand to the left <laughs> ear like my father when he's faked the hand, the handshake and he's pretending to run his hand through his hair. Like, here, I'm shaking my hand. I want you to show. Nope, I'm going to scratch my head. I was meaning to do that anyways. Do you realize how rare it is for P.J. Washington to get a flexing game-winning moment on a team that includes Kyrie Irving and Luka? He had his moment. He did. Premature flex. I mean, maybe play a little D down the court. Yeah. I mean, geez. Mm -hmm. He's flexing the whole Game's way. Game's not over. Just a 75 right. Get him for I mean, he he two on seconds fire. Left. He I lets Struess run right, right by him a while flexing. A guy who's never played hoops. That's play what it is. You nah. just stand there and flex at midcourt no, while Struess runs What by happens you. is if you play defense at that point and you get a foul call 75 feet from the basket, they go to the I'm, free throw line and shoot three shots. I'm not saying you get contact with him. I'm saying make some sort of gesture in his direction. He, Anything. No, you're wrong. Make him uncomfortable. Tony, you're saying leave him alone? You're saying flex and the guy hit four attention. threes in 44 He's seconds a quarter. Wait Tony's a minute, right. It's 75 Tony's right. feet. <laughs> it's three quarters of the they court away never, from the basket. More like a half quarter. I mean. Guys. You don't defend that. How, you can't how, go near that man. Get a hand in the face without fouling. Come on. No. Oh Come Guys, on, they man. never call that foul. And I'm not saying touch him. Until I'm, they do. I'm not saying hit him. I'm saying make one step of effort in his direction. Look, so we're watching on TV right now. So he passed it in. Nobody's supposed to be around him. He's... At the other, look, oh, somebody, no, Luca was there. Oh, Luca was there. Someone did it. There. All right, I'm just saying. See, but you're you're mad at what Luca did. All I I'm saying actually. is, do what Luca did there. You just looked at me like I'm an idiot. Like I will not allow the group of people here to take a three quarters shot and second guess the defense. Yeah. I'm not going to allow that you guys to see that sports moment and be like, well, somebody could have done something better against it. We just Thank made you, fun of PJ Washington. What are we doing here? It's the That's second longest doing. game winner in the history of the league. Yeah, the defense get, was irrelevant. But get a hand in the face. I mean, mm -hmm. <laughs> foul him on the inbound. Make it the longest. Come on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just keep fouling him. Because the hand in the face works so often in NBA basketball. Schuster. <laughs> get get a hand in the face so Stugatz can be there when you get the hand in the face and he can get more of your hand in the Take in a charge. Yep. Or foul him and block, I rip yep, you. Bl block yeah. the shot. You know he's going to be charging aggressively to take a shot. Take a charge. Are we happy for Struess? <laughs> I mean, he has to shoot. Exactly uh, right. Yeah, right. And he's got to do it quick, so he's going to be running. Yep. How do Heat fans experience that last night? I know I'm a Heat fan. Oh, it's just great. I was happy for him. Yeah, me too. He made fan. the right choice, right? It's what? just great and fun. He got his money. Man, They're he's good. A, he's on a better team. Yeah. Whoa. Um, he Be is, careful. He, it's statistically he, true. Um, They're he, the two seed. They don't want to see us in the playoffs. No one is taking the Cavs seriously. Like everyone, some people say they, they like should. Boston. Some people like the Bucks. Some people say the Heat. You know what? I am going to jump on the Cavs bandwagon. Mm -hmm. How about that? 
Yeah. Uh, based on no facts, that's the way that you do I that. Mean, uh, the two I, seed. I will say a couple of interesting things. You said two seed, but the distance between one and two in the East is larger than the distance between one and eight <laughs> in the West. Seven and a half back. So your yeah. argument Five means and a half nothing. Than the heat. Yeah. Uh, and beyond that, I would say that Cleveland was exceptional last year, and the reason no one believes in them is because they lost so soundly to your <laughs> Knicks in the first round. Right. It's the reason why. Yeah. That team, uh, I thought that Knicks team was going to drag the Knicks and the reason the people believe in the Knicks this year and don't believe in the Cavs this year is that first round series is <laughs> echoing when you lose to the Knicks that way everyone knows don't trust them do you guys really not think the Cavs are a better team than the Heat I believe that they were all of last year. They're but They're better offensively. They're better defensively. No, they the, have a better point the, differential by like the, five the, points a game. The, like heat how are you guys simply think gonna the Heat be, the heat are simply going to be measured by what they've done the last four years. Yep. People still fear them because of what they've done the last four years. It's yep. not going to be a regular season measurement. Uh, speaking of which, I want to speak about what it is that they did last night because a lot of people were enjoying. Uh, Billy, you're right. This year. Talking to crazy people. It's he a made point. such a it's sound argument. I mean, a, well, no, <laughs> I mean, they are over the span of this regular season thus far. The they culture, I guess. Five, well, no, they're five and a half games account, better. Most but the discipline, culture. hardest yeah. working. Yeah. Right. Except, want to except all the suspensions for fighting. The last 11 that. games, they won nine of their last 11. The, no, I mean, we don't have to do No, Billy, that, so Billy is right. This team is measured differently than most of them, but I would say that most of the doubt that you have out west of Minnesota, for example, who has been great, and even of Boston, who has been better than everybody, the measurement this year because of what the Heat did in the playoffs is show me in the playoffs because – we don't think the 82 games mean anything. That's fair. It's why you trust the Nuggets in the West. You do, even though they're the three seed right now. Uh, I don't uh, particularly care. You're right, Billy. Over the course of the first half of the season, it is not up for dispute. The Cavs are better than the Miami Heat. I believe what people were watching last night late in Portland when they were making fun of Joe Cronin, Stu Gatz, because last night, if you are a Miami Heat lover who enjoys hating on other teams, you got a couple of things happening. A whole lot of people were dragging the Portland GM who lost by 10 to a shorthanded Heat team last night for the quote and the story that he gave Adrian Wojnarowski. This has followed him around. This is Joe Cronin, the GM of the Portland Trailblazers, talking about how difficult he had it in trading uh, Lillard and how he was, uh, you know, ruining his future job life because his focus was eliminate the emotion, the frustration, the fatigue. And most of all, Cronin implored himself, don't settle don't let yourself settle. <laughs> and his team stinks, and all the players he didn't take from the Heat are the ones scoring all over the place. And now Lillard in Milwaukee is giving quotes to Gotts. These quotes I was not expecting to see, okay? He's sad, he's lonely, he has no life, uh, he is saying, in Milwaukee. He just goes home and refreshes uh, YouTube all the time to see if there are fresh fights uh, on YouTube. A lot of fights. And further, the life in your 30s, Dame. Like, that's what I do. We also, do that please. in Miami. <laughs> uh, he'd have a lot more stuff to do in Miami. But the point is, you made your bed. Now you got to sleep in it. Don't don't right. come to p complain to me, telling me that, oh, Milwaukee kind of sucks. I only do this and that. Yeah, buddy, you signed up. You've never been to Milwaukee before? I've been to Milwaukee, and I knew that. <laughs> he is saying that his Milwaukee life now, and the best thing that people usually say about Milwaukee is that it's close to Chicago. You can get there in about 90 minutes. Yep. Uh, his life, Lillard's superstar life, he says, is going home and praying that fight hype has refreshed on YouTube with no, with new fights. So prayer that your YouTube refreshes. And also he gives you this quote, which is not surprising, but to hear him say it out loud, him say it out loud of Milwaukee season, I thought we was going to be how Boston is right now because mm -hmm. Boston is a lot better than everybody and they're making it look easy and people still have doubts about Boston just because of what Miami did to them last year and because they lose game sevens at home what's Dame doing about it I mean about being as good as Boston I mean they got him to be as good as Boston to be better than Boston and all he's doing is complaining about Wisconsin well I love the state of Wisconsin Kenosha one of my favorite places on the planet there's nothing to do. I mean, so what? He has nothing to do. You know what he's there to do? To do something he's never done before, 
which is win an NBA championship. That's what he's there to do. He's not there to party. He's not there to go to the beach. He's not there to drink. He is there for business. He is there to do something that has escaped him his entire career, and that is winning. Well, when I told you, uh, you know, you, you just mentioned what's he doing to help Milwaukee be like Boston. I told you yesterday that Milwaukee has one of the top five most efficient offenses in the history of the sport. They don't play any defense, and it's a problem, and that doesn't win in the playoffs. And they're still very good, but the reason they're not Boston is because they don't play any defense. Mm -hmm. Can I go back to Cavs? We'll play D. Can I go back to Cavs? He for a second, Billy was saying that we were crazy. I just texted Tom Habistro. Oh, good. He's biased. And he said that in in a series where the Cavs are at home, the Heat would be favored. After last year's playoffs, no bookmaker is going to favor the Cavs. Okay. I'm just saying. I, I'm like, just giving you look, actual information. Right, but the that, Heat, in, but, the, in the month of February, the Heat had the best defense in the NBA. They've won nine of their last 11. Oh, They're eight go. games over 500 for the second time this season after losing seven in a row where we were all worried about their offense and their defense. Now Jimmy Butler's back playing the most efficient basketball he's played all year. I mean, look, the Cavs are the, the better team over the course of, what, 58 games of the regular season? Sure, but Dan, you mentioned it. They lost to the Knicks in the first round last year, and until they change it, maybe they got a bit of that culture coming from Max Struess, but until they change that, I, I don't anticipate oh, but it's not the Cavs are good because Max Struess no, brought it's culture not, no, no. over Billy, Well, no, that's now why you signed him. Are you going to take every argument against what we're saying? Like You were just arguing yes. in favor are of the Cavs. Are you not familiar no, with Billy's work? No, I'm Billy's asking. Yeah. I'm no, they've gotten better because of the additions they They're better because Max Struess brought culture. He's saying yeah, that's the difference in their team. The difference in their team this year is culture. Is is having a player like Max Struess available to them, who they signed for big money for a reason, and being able to to win in the playoffs is a different thing. Like, this Miami Heat team, Zach Harper said it on, on his podcast a couple of weeks ago, outside of the Celtics, he'd be the least surprised to see the Heat win the Eastern Conference. And there's a reason for that. The, the regular season has not mattered in the same way for this team over the last several years. I would like to continue, and someone help me with this because I'm tired of saying it, I want uh, some sound, some device that electrocutes people around here when they use the word culture. I'm sick of hearing it. Schuster. <laughs> and I, uh, the, the reason Cleveland lost in the playoffs last year is because their front line got decimated by Mitchell Robinson. It's not something anyone saw coming. <laughs> it's not a sentence you thought it's, you would ever it, say. And, and, and so it doesn't have to do with culture. It has to do with they couldn't rebound anything, and they've got Mobley, and how can they not rebound everything? Because of Mitchell Robinson. That's that's what happened. Like and Will it, Chamberlain. It, it, was confu- it was confusing to me how good Mitchell Robinson looked in that series. I'm sick of the Wisconsin slander, by the way. Madison's a great a great little town, sure. great college town. Maddie. You could hit the road, go up to Hayward. The world's largest muskie is there. It's like the freshwater fishing hall of fame in Hayward, Wisconsin. There's tons of things to do in Wisconsin if you like fishing. Give me the stat of the day, please. Start of the day, start of the day, it is the start of the day. Start of the day, start of the day, it is the start of the day. Start of the day, start of the day, it is the start of the day. Start of the day, start of the day, it is the start of the day. The Miami Heat have won more games in Portland this month than Portland. (laughs) I mean, thanks, Joe Cronin. I want to play Damian Lillard here just talking about uh, the top five players in the NBA. See if you notice here any omissions that are noticeable or any additions that are noticeable as Damian Lillard talks about top five people he wants to play with. If you could create your own starting five, what's your team? It would be me, LeBron, Steph, Kevin Durant, and I'm going to go with Bam out of bio. <laughs> Giannis? <laughs> Was that this season? <laughs> Man, that's while he's on the Bucks. Huh. Not saying Giannis hmm. <laughs> while you're on the Bucks is wild. Well, you just have is, to lie. He's played with him already, yeah, so he's talking he's, about guys that he hasn't yeah, played he with, that he'd to like play to play with. So he's we should replay that video. Already. I don't think that's what the question was. 
Uh, let's replay the video and see if we can trap Damian Lillard on not liking Giannis and liking Bam more than Giannis. If you could create your own starting five, what's your team? It would be me, LeBron, Steph, Kevin Durant, and I'm going to go with Bam out of bio. I mean, that's it didn't say create nope. your own starting yeah. five. <laughs> not guys you have played with or don't hmm. want to play with huh. or do want to play with that you <laughs> don't presently play with. If you pick with. Giannis, though, you have to also pick his brother. It'd be like if someone was like, what radio host, that's do, already you, two. What radio host do you want to work for? And I was like, Mike, Green, Mike Greenberg, Colin Cowherd, <laughs> Pat McAfee, <laughs> Bill Simmons. Rosillo. And Rosillo, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Can I give you a hot take? The Bucks are going to be fine in the playoffs. Really? Yeah. The play, the, uh, the regular season for the NBA doesn't matter. You just... Okay. He takes every argument. No, I'm just saying it doesn't matter. You guys are dismissing the you Cavs, just, saying they're not good. And it's like, well, they have been better in the regular season. But it doesn't matter. But defense matters. The Bucks will be fine in the playoffs. They'll play defense in the playoffs? They're like, going to have Damian Lillard, Lillard and Giannis in the playoffs. They'll Lillard, be fine. Yeah. Yeah. It's a tough one. They'll be okay. I, I'm with you. Totally. He's and right. Middleton. He's right. They're going to play the Sixers without him. But he made it to the like... finals as an eight seed last year. Like, the playoffs, the regular season is irrelevant in the NBA. I don't know why we put so much weight on it. Well, one other thing that is also irrelevant, because I don't think anyone's putting any weight on it. I believe that that's... Well, we're talking about it like if it matters. Well, it happens to be the sport that's going on right now. But it doesn't that, matter. That more, the most it's outside are... of football season, Bill. Well, Stugatz has a top five list of things oh, we talk about that. because it's outside of football <laughs> season. He's got a number of top five lists available to him, and everything that you're saying there is fair. But when it comes to illegitimate commentary, though, and I saw this on Jessica's face. I'm not sure if I recognized it or not. But Stugatz coming out a day after, right? I, I really, I flinch every time around here. We Whatever. make fun of some city being terrible because I think of all the listeners we have in that city who were hurt by Stugatz con condescending their city. So yesterday, he went after all of Indiana while today saying how Wisconsin is one of his favorite places. And I simply don't believe that the words he's saying are <laughs> anything but flabbergasting lies. Mm -hmm. uh, Jessica, I know you tend to support Stugatz in most of his stupidities, but I thought I saw in your face something that registered, my God, how can he say that with a straight face? It's the constant on the Midwest for me, Dan. I support Stugatz in almost all of his endeavors, but you said it. Indiana, now Wisconsin, what next? Minnesota? I mean, listen, Iowa? I love, Ohio. I Illinois? Love, I love Chicago. Yeah. Great city. I love Evanston. Ah. I said I love Kenosha, one of my favorite cities in the United States of America. Indiana, I ripped on Monday. Wisconsin, I ripped a year ago when I had to go to Marquette. Okay, Billy, I see your reaction there. When you betray Stugatz, uh, now I know. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's my Howard Dean reference it, that I made in the middle, hoping I anyone was, would catch I was, that. I thought that's what that was. <laughs> Please tell me more, Stugatz, about all the things you love about Kenosha. Just uh, go. That's uh, a great city. I got to tell you, Dan, that city, the main street on that city is so fantastic. It has a mom and pop hardware store. There are tons of things to do. Great bars, great scene. What, what tons of things are there? Name to a do? bar. Uh, in Kenosha, Wisconsin, uh, there's Sally's. Okay, check it out. Look it up. Mustang Sally's, I believe it's called. Uh, I think it's a little bit off Main Street, but you should go check it out if you're in the uh, Kenosha area. That's all I have. They have one bar. It's a small town. It's quaint. It's from another time, Dan. It really is industrial. You see all the smoke coming out of the stacks there. It's like it's all the blue. pollution, all it's, the pollution, all the smog and pollution. It's blue collar, Dan. That's Chemical. what it is. A bunch of people working hard, just trying to get through the day and pay their bills. You know, I love them. Clay's Tap. Oh, I forgot about Clay's Tap. One of the all time great bars in Wisconsin. It really is. One of my top five bars in Wisconsin. I just set myself up for you asking me. Top five bars in Wisconsin. I don't have another four. Crispy's Tavern. Oh, I love that place. That's I love his dyslexia. When he puts the R before the E in, tav in Tavern. Yeah, it's a tough one. But I love a good Tav, if you know what I'm saying. You get some good beef stew there. You get some good shepherd's pie there. You get a couple of nice beers, you know, some good chicken wings. Great scene. They have trivia night every Wednesday. The other thing we got wrong, I got a couple of things wrong yesterday. Evidently. I left out the Rat Race Lounge. I mean, what a great place. Right. Drink specials every Thursday night. I mean, it's amazing.
amazing. Great jukebox. They have a cigarette machine in there. They do. Old school. I can't argue with this because I think I think Chris is just reading him. He is. The bars, I mean, I'm watching. I'm, all of the things you got is making up about the them is probably race, true. The Rat they Race Lounge has a cigarette machine. I'm, just, yeah, I'm watching you. Chris Cody. Been there. Uh, look up everything, and and I believe he also emailed or texted Stugatz a menu from a local tavern. <laughs> <laughs> I love cheese curds. <laughs> Charlie's 10th hole, Dan. It is fantastic. It's a nine-hole golf course. Usually the bar is the 19th hole. Go f*** yourself. They have the 10th hole. Yesterday on the show, David Sampson came on and read a cease and desist on Greg Cody. It really kind of backfired on him trying to just uh, do business correctly and professionally. And a lot of people have written in complaining about just in general all of it. I can't do any more merch store drama. Bleep the merch store. I'm so tired of hearing about the merch store's content. I think we all need to boycott it so it'll close down. They can't still be trying to make content out of this. Who needs $40 t-shirts anyways rise up cancel the merch store uh there is a new discount code uh at the merch store he haw 21 it's 21 percent <laughs> off all vegas themed items it is more than the samson sucks 20 discount of 20 percent and it is live now levitardaf.com uh that went more poorly for you than i imagine that you thought it would right you are over here just trying to enforce rules and Greg Cody is uh, braying laughter in your face. Ba-dip. I was just doing the job that you asked me to do, and it was not a bit. It was it was just something that had to be communicated, and it was much easier to do on the air because it's hard to reach Greg. He's such a superstar now. He doesn't take calls. He doesn't do anything but Greg Cody's show. And does he still write for the Herald? He does. I don't know if he does columns anymore, but between your show and his show, the only way to do it is on your show. But I think the bigger point is a real point. Uh, there's great stuff on levitardaf.com, and we just have to be clear to everybody who owns what. And Dan, you were very clear to me that you own all. <laughs> hmm. Uh, Jeremy, uh, I was not very clear to you. You and I did not have that conversation. Skipper took the merch store as soon as we came over. So and- to be clear, after yesterday's merch store subject being not going well we're doing it again that is correct yeah also on top of that jeremy uh was told how about this one he learned secondhand that they're now turning down tour dates that greg cody toured it uh turned it down when jeremy wanted to do it yeah that's where the money's made we've all seen from the eras tour that you can make money off of touring it's not about the merch it's about the tours and i'm finding out by listening to this show that Greg Cody is turning down possible money making opportunities for us in our touring days I'm 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 not happy about this. It seems like Greg and Yeti are sort of creating their own business they model are, where they're yes. the hee-haw too yep. and excluding me from a lot, and I'm, I'm not enjoying that. Well, Greg is a front man. It's his band, right? He's the lead singer. He right. decides. What, listen, he has to feel like he's in the mood to do a certain consideration. show. Right? Well, no. No? <laughs> We're the hee-haw three. We're supposed to be a unit. It's unbelievable. You think the Rolling Stones tour without Mick Jagger Correct. wanting to tour? Yep. Uh, thank you for mentioning that because we've got some Paul McCartney video that I want to play for you and the audience here about Foreigner. Foreigner has been nominated for the Hall of Fame. I introduced my wife to Foreigner recently and told her they should be in the Hall of Fame. What's Paul McCartney saying about Foreigner in the Hall of Fame? Foreigner? Not in the Hall of Fame? What the f***? <laughs> <laughs> What was that? I'll play it again Please. for you just so that you understand more specifically. Farmer? Not in the Hall of Fame? What the f***? <laughs> How old is McCartney? He's like 81. <laughs> this is the best video I've ever seen. What does he think that noise is at the end? <laughs> I don't even know what it was. Let's try it again. Farmer? Not in the Hall of Fame? What the f***? <laughs> <laughs> Samson, foreigner in the Hall of Fame? Should they be in the Hall of Fame? Absolutely. Absolutely. I can't live for, is it I can't live for loving you? That's not one of their top You don't even know, Dave, so how can you say absolutely? Five songs, cold as ice. <laughs> you know, but this reminds me, Dan. <laughs> guys like, guys like. Corner expert, huh? Guys like, like Sammy corner. Sosa. <laughs> yeah. Guys not like in. Sammy Sosa, not in the Hall of Fame. You know, Foreigner, not in the Hall of Fame. What the fuck? <laughs> Was Foreigner on steroids? I don't get what Jeremy's doing there. I don't know if I like it. 
I'd like to, uh, we'll talk about some sports business stuff, but something that I wanted to talk to you and the room about. Uh, I have thought throughout my life that Wendy's has one of the great fast food values anywhere in food. I like their fries. I like their Frosty. But now they're doing dynamic pricing, and I can't believe how poorly it's being received where during busy hours, like the Sun Pass Stugats, in a form of gouging, they're going to raise prices. They're announcing that they're raising prices beginning in 2025. What are your thoughts there, Samson? Because the reaction to it has been very poor. Yeah, I, I, I think that it came out. It didn't come out from a PR. It actually came out in an earnings call where they were projecting what's happening in 2025 and there were big expenses that are incurred in 24 to make all of the boards digital, all of the menu boards digital at Wendy's because that's the only way you can have dynamic pricing. So the board had to get explained in earnings and analysts, et cetera. But let's talk about dynamic pricing. It reflects actually what people are willing to pay for a product at any given time. Ballparks have had dynamic pricing for over a decade now, and that is the difference between what used to be A-level games, some people call them gold games, and then silver games and bronze games. And the reason why that was stopped is opposing team owners did not want to be categorized by the home team as being a bronze team or a, you know, a unshiny object. So they changed it to this dynamic pricing where, hey, let the fans decide what they're going to pay for a ticket. And I think this is the beginning, not the end. It's sort of like streaming. You better get used to it. Dynamic pricing at fast food, that's not going away. Can't they just do it without announcing it? Because I feel like more P- like I feel like that's an easier way. The PR like, of just this headline, it's just not a good look. It, they, they had to discuss it during an earnings call, and these earnings calls go public, but the rules are when you're a public company, you are forecasting, you're projecting, you're explaining, and then you're trying to get the street, Wall Street, to understand where your company is supposed to go. And so that's how it was announced. But remember, it was announced for 2025, but all the headlines are now. But by the time it happens, none of us will, be, will remember it. We'll just know that the fries are more during the busy time. I'm glad this is happening because you know what? It's going to make me not go to Wendy's whenever they're like, I don't know if I'll ever go to Wendy's again. I'm sorry. It's over. You'll go I, again. No. The spicy chicken. I, no. Again. no. Spicy chicken I, I got <laughs> spicy chicken other places. I can go to Chick-fil-A. I can go to anywhere else that has spicy chicken. They should have partnered with Wemby and called themselves for six months Wemby's. Okay. That all of a sudden, good PR. We're okay. back. That's it. Do you think this is going to hurt their business, David? No, I actually don't, because the whole purpose is to actually get people in when it's not as crowded. And so you're actually getting more business during off times for the people who are looking for more value. And those people that go during the busy times are there because it's part of their schedule. It's part of their daily routine. And they're going to pay the extra 30 cents for fries or whatever the price is for the burger. That's the whole concept of dynamic pricing. And it has been proven over and over again to work that there are people who will pay the premium and that's who you're catering to, pun not intended, and the people who don't want to pay the premium, let them come at 2 a.m. So Wendy's is doing what's called a reverse happy hour, so an unhappy hour. (laughs) So if you walk in and you're like, hey, I need a burger, and they're like, great, buddy, it's another two bucks, and you're like, damn, what the hell? I thought it was happy hour. No, unhappy hour, sorry. Have you ever gotten a taxi in New York City during primetime hours, there's more fees. Not everything should be surge pricing. This is, this is, oh God, these are the issues with late stage capitalism. No, Jeremy, if you ran, Jeremy, if you ran a business, you would do exactly what Wendy's is doing. Jeremy, one second. If you ran a business, you would do exactly what it is that Wendy's is doing. This is why I don't want to run a business. It's no different than the express lane on the turnpike. It's, it's like, re- if you go there during what? a heat game and they jack it up to $15, I'm getting in that lane. I have a I problem care. with that, too. Right. We shouldn't be doing surge pricing everywhere. People can't afford this. Like, this is this is a problem with, with fast parking. food with fast food services. This is not meant for rich people. The premise is that it should be affordable. Yeah. But go at 4 p.m. The CEO of Kellogg said that we should eat cereal <laughs> to make up for that. <laughs> at Don't night, start with dinner, guy, please. So. By the way, Wendy's at 2 a.m. is better than Wendy's at 6 p.m. Agreed. Thank you.
Put it on the poll. Now at it's Levitar- cheaper, too. At Levitard Show, do you like cereal for dinner? Uh, Jeremy, your outrage is the correct way to feel about Thank this. Thank you. Uh, Stugatz being pro-gouging, not surprising in any way whatsoever. Um, uh, but just it, the, just saying everything should be cheaper is just kind of, that's okay, not what I'm saying. But it's, I mean, it's disproportionately affects poor people whose health is disproportionately affected by being able to afford to have right. uh, fast food. And this Fast is, food's not affordable now anyways, like as it is. Nothing it's is. It's kind of insane. Nothing like You go is. to fast food, you get a meal for three, it's like $34. Inflation has hurt a lot of people in a lot of different ways. And this is the way that Uber and Lyft do it. Is it the future, David? It's the present. So I, I, I hear what Jeremy's saying, but they've been in, in, in changing the price of parking for playoff games since before LeBron came. During the Shaq run, the pricing to go to a Heat game changes. Playoff ticket prices are more than a regular season game that you're all calling irrelevant. So there's been this sort of pricing for premium product all the time, we're just calling it something different. And dynamic pricing, you should all love because that's true supply demand. Yeah, so, so I, have I no love idea that how you the CEO of Wendy's will get to hoard even more wealth now. Awesome. But like a, like a hamburger at 4 p.m. versus a hamburger at 1 p.m. is not a premium product. It's the exact same product. Yep. Fast food isn't a premium product. If you're telling me I'm getting Wagyu beef, I'm going to pay whatever it is to get that Wagyu beef, but I'm getting whatever it is that they're giving me that I probably shouldn't be eating anyway. <laughs> it's the time, not the product. It's the affecting disproportionately of poor people and the gouging that is offensive. Well, it's like the lack of consumer what? protection yeah, that, like, companies will just continue to. <laughs> Billy, and, Billy and Tony are arguing over the I, pronunciation I, I, Dan, of Wagyu. I'm going to go over there and, like, fly chokeslam Billy. I swear to you. I didn't say days. anything. I man. swear to you, Dan. Do you want the Nacho Libre costume? <laughs> Have you ever been on an airplane and had to choose a different time because there's a lower price if you take a 7 a.m. flight versus an 11 a.m. flight? Off peak, yeah. Air travel is a luxury, also. Yep. I, I think that, that that's not even the point, though, because there, there are people that think that uh, airlines price gouge and that's bad and there should be some sort of limit to it, especially because in this country there's not really many ways to get around compared to in Western Europe where you can take a flight for $50 somewhere or take a train for $50 somewhere. In the U.S., you're limited by your options. Yeah, obviously it's a it's a big country, right. but so Europe is also very yeah. large. Uh, this is a it's a bad comparison. And this is besides the point. We're talking about a product that is like, you know, five dollars, four dollars. This is just a terrible decision in PR to not just say, hey, we're raising our prices, but we're going to have happy hour now, like Tony said. We're going to do, if you come between four and six, you get a dollar off your Baconator or you get a a 50 cents off your Frosty. And instead they're like, hey, no, we're going to do dynamic pricing because we're a stupid little tech company. Would it be better? Would Would you guys like it better if it was just all prices are up? They are. If you guys pay attention, they are. They have been. They going already up are. Years. I know. I'm just saying. If this headline no was, one's happy. Ins- they, also, this- they also fast food places also have different prices based on location. Like, so you can go to a McDonald's here and a McDonald's five blocks, and if you pay attention, it's like thirty cents different. There's different prices at every McDonald's. It's not quite what we're presently talking about, though. We're talking about <laughs> this for a reason. Dynamic we're, pricing. We've got more with Samson next. During the break, uh, not surprisingly, Stu got uh, delighted, his face awash in glee, when he created a for rich people only Wendy's Express Lane. Uh, a willing to pay more only Express Lane. That's it. That's all. Sometimes talking. you're in a rush. There's a separate lane for a people who are willing lane. to pay more. Right. If you want to wait and pay normal prices, feel free to do so. That's Nightmare fair. Country. Yeah, make everything first class and and uh, and coach. Make everything. Uh, I mean, it's it already is sort of that. It's just not quite as your overt. highways are like that. It's not quite as overt as what Wendy's is present. It does doing. seem like it's hard for Wendy's to please people outside of just lowering their prices. Yeah, like I disagree. Which they probably could do. No, I'm not well, saying that's how you could do dynamic pricing. Like, oh, this is an off hour. It'll be lower money. Before this conversation, I've always thought of Wendy's as a place that only pleases people that it's a place the that frosty. is is only I mean. pleasure i would bathe in a bathtub full of that frosty. Stu just got me back with the frosty he did things were different when dave was around dan that ever since true. we lost dave that's true things have been totally different do you guys buy the frosty key tag i have one in my wallet 
So I used, this is a whole. This that is must a whole be from six thing. years ago. No, this is from this year. It says 2024. Before you could buy that frosty key tag for one dollar, wow. and it is always at the end of the year. So you get the frosty key tag, and with any purchase, you just show them that, and they give you a small frosty for free. With any purchase, it used to cost a dollar. Now it's up to three dollars. It's gone. Last year was two dollars. Now it's three dollars. That's still a good deal. It it kind of is though. And a year like, this supply. Is, this a year is arguing supply. David's point is that like I'm now paying triple what I paid two years ago for it. But in my head, I'm like, well, I just get three frosties a year, and it's already paid for, so it's good. I was willing to pay three dollars for it when two years ago it only cost one dollar. We have been remiss in not celebrating. Where'd my key tag go? David Sampson. Jeremy has it. And nothing personal have celebrated today. He just got off the air celebrating their thousandth episode. Um, are we doing anything more to celebrate that with David other than that crappy fanfare? Well, like we do around here, we want to celebrate his 1,000th episode in song. We love you. We've got you. We've all got each other. Let's go right now. One, two, three, Brett. One, two, three, Brett. Why am I sitting in a ball glove chair? You're the strangest guy alive. Sold a team for about a billion dollars. It's all business, nothing personal, honey. I'm cashing in on this podcast and money. It's time to celebrate 1,000 episodes where I tell you to wait to see. <laughs> oh, as I'm running through the tall skyscrapers, got some news that made me go pee pee. There's a new show in town, Papa Tori finds out, and I'm seething with the jealousy. Just put me in the main show feed. What's the problem with the movies that I'm seeing? Yeah, that Ferk is out of touch. I find it hard to have human feelings. And you fear dogs a bit too much. Dan Levitard says I'm made out of wires. The word of the day is short selling buyers. It's time to celebrate 1,000 episodes where I tell you to wait to see. Are you going to download another 1,000 episodes? Well, I guess I'll have to wait to see. That really doesn't feel like a celebration of David <laughs> Sampson or his thousand episodes. He does like the song, though. We do a thousand every three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you. That is the most production value that you've ever added to Nothing Personal. So I appreciate that. <laughs> you were screaming for a doorbell one day. <laughs> It does exist a, a, a little bit on the periphery of what it is that we're doing here, but congratulations on a thousand episodes. It's a big milestone, a long time to talk to yourself, uh, many episodes to tell people that what they need to do in sports is wait and see. It's it's something that started off small, and I, and you actually were one of my first guests in a Samson sit-down, and all I remember of our show is that Mike Ryan basically wanted all of it edited out because he was so concerned with what we were talking about. And it seems like a long time ago, and it's four years ago. But we are going to keep going. And uh, thank you for bringing us on board. Love being a part of Metal Arc. I don't love the position you put me in, Dan, uh, outside of the podcast, which you do purposefully, and you do it both <laughs> in the name of content but also in the name of running a business. And it causes issues with Greg and with so many other people within Metal Arc. And for that, I'm not happy. But to be able to do the, the show uh, under the Metal Arc umbrella for that, I am happy. Promo code HEEHAW21. It's 21% off. A little more than Samson Sucks 20, the 20% 20 off code. Uh, the Carolina Panthers, speaking of sucking, uh, they were really terrible last year and then raised their ticket prices. Your thoughts there? I think again, let's let's I want to hear from the room because if you're going to complain about them raising the ticket prices, the reason why they're able to do it is that people are willing to pay more even though the team is 2 and 15. Now they could have done better PR. We used to raise ticket prices in different areas after losing seasons but always announce that the majority of seats are lower or overall there's zero increase because we wanted the people paying more to pay more than more. I mean, one of the people who don't really pay at all to keep paying nothing at all. And so the Panthers PR was terrible. But in terms of raising prices, just so you know, there's no correlation between losing 
and the inability to raise prices, and Carolina is showing that now. Can you tell me where we are with Vegas and Oakland and the Oakland A's? Uh, Rob Manfred came out. We didn't even talk about this. <laughs> what happened with your interview with Rob and, and the ramifications of that last week. But uh, he came out and said it's solid. Solid as a rock, Ashford. They are going to Vegas. There's just no deal. I haven't seen any deal. I haven't seen any signed documents. Haven't seen whether a ballpark can fit on nine acres. Oakland has to announce where it's playing for the next few years before they get a stadium opened. I think there's just so much green to cover. Can you still birdie a hole when you're 300 yards out? You can, but you better hit like three really good shots in a row. And I think that's where Oakland is right now. And in terms of their payroll and all the complaints about John Fisher and the hope that he sells, just know that uh, people used to fly banners over Shea Stadium asking the Wilpons to sell. Everyone wanted Laurie to sell or Huizinga and then Henry. Everyone wants everyone to sell until someone else buys and then they want them to sell. The A's are not being sold today or tomorrow. And uh, I think the A's could still stay in Oakland, believe it or not. But we'll wait to see. But it, it's looking like you're going to be wrong on that once the commissioner says it, it's solid, correct? Well, but what else is he going to say? You think he's going to actually get in get well, in he do doesn't an interview? He doesn't have to say anything. He doesn't have no, to say anything. You do. That's the job of the commissioner is actually to push things along by promulgating hopes, if not falsehoods. That's what we would ask Bud Sealing to do throughout our whole process in Miami is to get out there and either be the bad guy or the good guy, depending on what we needed at a particular time in the process. It has nothing to do with the reality. It has to do with positioning and the dynamic of the negotiating relationship. So a commissioner's jo job, and you see Roger Goodell doing this all the time, you say things, everything is with a purpose. So every word Rob says has a meaning and is done for a reason. Is he a smart guy? Extraordinarily. Th that's actually not true. No, don't do this again, please. <laughs> You're going to get all of us in trouble, Dan. Well, what was the blowback last time? Because you and I didn't actually talk on the air. You ju or we didn't talk off the air either. You just said that we were blackballed or that our show was blackballed from baseball, and it was the first I was learning of it. Well, it got aggregated, and uh, it got the attention of baseball, and, and, and they made a statement saying that it wasn't true. So the good news is that you can now, whoever you want from the commissioner's office, you should ask. Maybe they'll come on the show to do an interview with you. I was always under the impression, because like with the Marlins, we couldn't get any of our players to really go on your show because they viewed you as overwhelming and mean and trying to trick them and trying to get them. And so the players just wouldn't do it. And then the owner didn't want anyone doing your show. So it's not an uncommon thing for people not to want to do your show, as manifested sometimes through your guest list. So I would say that uh, the commissioner says that maybe someone will come on again. But when the spokesperson denies it and you're claiming the opposite, what's true and what's not true there? I'm, I'm really more of a consequentialist. And I, and I don't want to get in trouble again, but isn't the proof in the pudding? Has anyone been on your show? I mean, we don't ask for many baseball players, to be fair. But And I didn't even notice what you're claiming is a blackballing. I, I, I did, it's not something that I know. Blackballing such a – I don't like that word. Did I use the word blackball? Yes. We've oh, had Marlins it. on. We've had Marlins on. Skip Schumacher on. in studio. Yeah. It's an unfortunate word. I'm glad, actually, the Marlins are, are more taking to you. And I like that they send free stuff to all of you now. That's something that's really good. You get those media packets with swag. That's a positive. Maybe it'll get you. What they really want you to swag. do is speak positively about the Marlins. Uh, yeah, I think he's spelling it with a C-H there. I think he's putting, it's not a W in swag. It's a S-C-H is how he's spelling swag. swag. What movie are you reviewing for us this week? I, I'm going to give oxygen to a movie that I, I, I'm very sorry to do. But did anyone see the new Jennifer Lopez documentary? No, but I saw no. she posted a misquoted uh, review on her Instagram story saying that it was like a, a brave movie, but the full context was like it was brave that she made this terrible movie, <laughs> essentially. She paid for it herself, right? Didn't she pay $20 million to 20. tell the story of her love life? Well, so she paid $20 million, but of course you in the room paid the $20 million. Everyone who buys the tickets and everyone who does everything with her, uh, that's who paid for it. It's called This Is Me Now. And it's all about her love life. It's all about how she wants love and has never had love and now has love and didn't before. And it's really just a big music video. It's so bad.
I, that it only got green lit because it's JLo and Ben Affleck plays some sort of bizarre character and a guy named Fat Joe is her therapist. A guy. It's a guy named Fat so, Joe. A guy, Joey Crack. Well, the guy, the real Fat Joe playing Fat Joe. It's only 66 minutes. That's the good news. The better news is I've saved you and your entire audience 66 minutes of your life. You do not need to see this under any scenario. It is horrible. Uh, Samson, thank you. Real quick, we've got less than 30 seconds left. I urge the audience to check out Nothing Personal. What are you and Adnan Verk uh, willing to say about what you're going to do for the Oscars? In 20 seconds? Thanks for the promotion. We're trying to work with Metal Arc so we can do a live show from Miami, like an Oscar party, a pre-party, and then a watch party during the Oscars. And I have no indication whether it's greenlit or not because I can't get anyone to return a call. So, Dan, <laughs> if you could possibly, okay. the Oscars are like in 10 days. Uh, okay, great. So it'd be good to great, know. Great, uh, You're all invited to a party that none of you are going to attend, an Oscar party that we may or may not do. Thank you, David. Juju, please put it on the poll at Lebetard Show. Will you always stop and watch a game show video that has gone viral? Because I believe that the way that all of us consume game shows today in the modern age is when a Wheel of Fortune clip or a Jeopardy clip, <laughs> or in this case, a Price is Right clip, makes an appearance nationally. I believe this has to be, maybe there is a spin in the history of Price is Right that is as great as what we're about to watch here, but I don't think there's ever been anything better, Stugat. So, as, as a way of setting this up, I'm going to tell you that the participant who is now spinning the wheel is doing so after the first spinner has gotten 90 cents, right. the second spinner has gotten 95 wow. cents, Wow! and now this is the oh. third spinner. And what's spinner. the goal of this for people that don't know? Well, the goal is to get a dollar. Yes, and, closest uh, to a dollar. Right, two spins yes. or a spin that will get you a dollar or closest to a dollar. I said everybody knows the rules, and no one in this room knows the rules of prices. What did you guys do when I've you never were seen sick at home? Well, Maury, probably. Maury. But Maury? Yeah. Maury. I don't know. Lots I've never seen a second of The Price is Right. What? Ever. The Price is Right is a staple to a sick day. All Billy's I know, right. this is yeah. what I know. Steve, come on down. Yeah! Woo! And then he goes, and, he, and then that's all they I know. They don't do that anymore. What? Yeah, now the studio of COVID ruined everything. The Price is Right being the most important of things ruined by COVID. So now they just have like eight people in the audience, and I think like what? everyone gets called. Yeah, they have like little pods of people. It's like a whole annoyance. It's not a thing. You want to know a fun, fa a fun Hollywood fact about The Price is Right that I was given, Dan? Yes. The Price is Right and Bill Maher use the exact same stage. You just move all wow. the props off of the stage wow. for The Price is Right, and then Bill Maher does whatever he does at <laughs> That's night. That's hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> I did watch that documentary about the guy who like perfected The Price is Right. Did you guys see that? That guy was wrong. That guy was wrong. So the guy the would price watch. Price is wrong, bitch. He, Happy he, Gilmore. Nice. That's the only thing I know. Bob Barker when he punches Happy Gilmore. Hell of a left hook. Yeah. We actually share a studio without kick. Those are not apples and oranges on the analogous comparison. <laughs> Price is right and Bill Maher are on opposite ends of the fun spectrum, True. are they not? Yep. Fair point. <laughs> Don't know much about either, honestly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, take me through here, uh, because there was a lot of stuff that I found objectionable about what you guys were saying there, but one thing I didn't understand at all. At the center of the Price is Right documentary you guys are talking about, were you saying that the subject of the movie was wrong or was wronged? Wronged, with a D. The man went and he did his studies and he knew the prices of things based on watching the show. They recycled the same prizes over and over again. And he just had, like, a list of what all the prizes were worth. So when he had to guess the prices, he knew them because he watched the show so much. Now, he was an idiot for getting it down to the dollar because then it's like, well, hold on. Something's up here. You got to sell it. Yeah. Exactly right. right. Be off by, like, $25. Yep. Mm -hmm. You got to do, like, the, oh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. fake it a little bit. Right. Agonizing Look over out to the it. crowd. Right. Like, what do you yes. guys think? Smugness yeah. was the real crime there, I suppose. <laughs> this is it a... Always is. 
what I will describe, I'm going to just say it, the greatest uh, set of spins in the history of Price is Right. So I'm really? Gonna, I'm going to set it up again for you guys who don't know how this game is played. The the He's got to get 100 cents, a total of 100 cents, because the first two spinners are as close as you can possibly be. Nine, There are no one cents on the wheel. It's just five, uh, an, five cent increments. So the first spin was 90 cents. The second one, 95 no, cents. So he has right. to get 95 or a dollar. That With two spins, right. he's got to get to 100. He's got to get over 90 and 95. It's damn near impossible. But look at what happens here. You want to say hi? My mom, my brothers, my sisters, my nieces, my nephews, and all my friends I met today on the way here. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, man. Oh, just, just to taunt you. So <laughs> lands on 90. Okay. So basically, at this point, the only things that help him on the wheel are five and a dime. Right. But then, if he wins, he gets another spin. Good. Five or a dime are the only things that help him here. Oh. So you would think. Exactly a dime. I thought, yes, it lands on a dime, and I thought, okay, this is as good as this video gets. This is miraculous just by itself that this guy was able to land on the one spot on the wheel that helps him win. But now he wins a bonus what a wheel spin. Round. That was a 95, a 90, and then a dollar for Mew. Everybody was spinning big. Oh, my God! Everybody was spinning big on that one. So this wheel's got some mojo in it right now. Uh, you got a 1000 bucks. You're on your way to the showcase. And now you get an extra chance to take money from us. One spin, 5 or 15, gets you $10,000. Dollar gets you $25,000. Good on. luck. <laughs> Good luck. One spin... Spin for your life. Come on, money. For, he's got to land in one of three places to win money, and there's only one place on the wheel he can land to get all $25,000. No. No. Lands on a dollar. You will all stop on that, correct? You guys will all stop on game show winning joy that goes viral, correct? Or or game or one, misery, yeah. Which, which one will you stop on more? <laughs> you're going to stop on more instead of joy. You're going to stop on the person you can make fun of for being dumb, right? I would light the camera on the guy who spun the wheel and got ninety five cents because ninety five cents never loses, never loses in prices. Uh, prices right, and it's just like, yep, you're out of here, right? That person, Goodbye. That person looked like P.J. Washington at the end of the Flexing. game. Hands Flexing. Hands out. And then, yes, and then. Does that not happen a lot? I don't know. It don't... doesn't happen a lot, but that I've never seen happen. Like, that sequence of events is as, it's as mathematically improbable as any sequence of events that could possibly happen on So I show. see that everybody has name tags, right? So everybody in the crowd also has name yeah. tags. Does that mean that they're eligible to go on the show and yes. spin? Yeah, yes. the crowd right. does seem to be bigger than it was that the last time I loud, watched. Yeah. yeah. So people... People can't be happy for the guy because they're like, damn, that could have been me. No, you're always happy. That's the thing. You cheer for everyone. Right. And you help yeah. everyone. The whole crowd is yelling. Yeah, yeah but like, it could have been me, and it's not. I know. No, that's the guy. only place There's in America There's a tinge of jealousy. Yes, <laughs> of course. There is. There's a tinge of jealousy. <laughs> I don't care what anyone says. You think people shout like the wrong prices so they do poorly? <laughs> so there's still a spot for them? <laughs> that's a know. good question. I, I would. I want to ask uh, the entirety of the group here. Whittingham took a quite a beating here just for the year that he was here. And yesterday on the show, everyone turned on him for being uh, publicly a coward who has walked away from his crusade of being a pioneer who normalizes the word penis to a national broadcasting audience. He ran into a nemesis here. And you guys help me out. I don't know who Pat Tomasulo is from Chicago. Is he a famous... Chicago uh, sports radio or sports television personality. Can any of you help me with who this He's is? He's a sports anchor on WGN Morning News in Chicago. He went after Chicago. Chris Whittingham. Excuse me, Chicago. <laughs> uh, Thomas Sulo went after Whittingham. Is this Jim's brother? Uh, I don't. Uh, it's not Tom Sula. <laughs> it's not the swamp, mon swamp monster. I'm glad you brought him up, though. J yeah, thank you. That didn't stop me at all. It was a very good joke with Brings a, us total back to a totally time. different name, not the accurate name or the guy that I'm talking about. Tom Sula. That would have been a better time to keep your microphone off. Let's. Uh, Everyone's let happier thinking about Jim Tom Sula. Put it on the poll at Levitard Show, Juju. 
<laughs> is everyone happier when they think of the swamp monster Jim Tom Sula? I have to be honest, I am. I mean, he should have left his mic shut, but I am I am happy you brought the name. Next up. time I'll Thank do you. it straight to your ear. Thank you. <laughs> Pat Thomas Sulo goes after Whittingham this way. Broadcasters are on platforms smaller than that that don't use the word either. And so why am I going to continue? It, we, we made headlines. It turned into a thing on the show. This is a big program with a big reach. And yet somehow I was the only one. What? Wow. No the mistake. only one? <laughs> yeah. Let me tell you something. I walked so you could run. That's right. That's I've been right. saying penis since before <laughs> you could shave, which, judging by the looks of you, yeah. was yesterday. <laughs> Nobody else is doing it. For the last 10 years, you turn on this show any day of the week. I might say penis. I might say testicles. I might say vas deferens, frenulum, corpus spongiosus, <laughs> prostate. Whatever I got to say to accurately convey information to my viewers is what I'm going to say. Are there days when I can do better? Of course. Sometimes I'm lazy, and I might say that a guy got hit in his Indiana bones or his Chuck Dickens, <laughs> but I will be dead if I let you ignore the sacrifices I have made in the name of journalism and, quite frankly, for a better America. An yeah. America where every yeah. man's broad stripe and bright stars is treated with the dignity oh. and respect they deserve. Oh, That's right. right. <laughs> God bless America. We were really disappointed as a show in Whittingham yesterday. <laughs> That's a real chuckle fest, that show. Huh? My boy dropped some For bars, though. So. <laughs> yeah, he wrote it in a prompter, which is the best part. Honey, come I on. might say ovary. I might say uterus. I might say clitoris. Whoa. I might say vulva. Whoa. I might say labia minora. <laughs> I might say labia majora. <laughs> Fallopian tubes. There's a lane Cervix. here. There's a lane here. If Pat Tomasulo can take that lane. There's a lane here for you, Jessica, <laughs> to be the shocking announcer. I'm running who... out of body parts. Someone feed me another one. <laughs> Indiana Bones was good. I mean... Stars and Stripes was good, too. <laughs> Bringing America into it. Uh, I need to make a couple of corrections from yesterday. I got fooled by the internet again. It happens. Kemba Walker did not score 92 points overseas. What? You and I, uh, you and I also described every time the entire show, when it was talking about NVIDIA, pronounced it wrong uh, because uh, I pronounced it the only way. NVIDIA? You, uh, that's the way. Uh, it's an N and a V. That's how I thought everybody would pronounce it. We all pronounced it wrong. But also, uh, Billy is now feuding with Disney adults. Do we need to make a correction here? Because I don't know that you've had a bigger fight than the one you're presently in. I mean, I, I have a public apology coming out. Well, not apology, but I, I tried to address this on Mystery Crate this week because factually there were some things that I was inaccurate about. And I feel like, as you know me, I'm all about accuracy. So, like, I did say that Disney's Magic Kingdom used to be the happiest place on Earth, and now they changed to the most magical place on Earth. Apparently, Disneyland was the happiest place on Earth always, and in Orlando is always the most magical place on Earth. But that doesn't change the fact that some of the things that I said may, may, have, been, may have been accurate about, you know, them not being super nice, and they used to be nicer. And then I said that there should be separate lines for adults, and there should be separate lines... For people with children, and then Disney adults were mad about that. And I said, you know what? I feel like if you actually think about it, this would make a faster experience for you guys as well because kids take forever in these lines. But they weren't happy about that. So I might say Hyman. <laughs> <laughs> you allowed to say these words in Florida? Is that, is that a car? I mean, what are we talking about here? That actually was a joke on <laughs> Curb, a car? like two like two weeks ago. They were talking the about that. Yeah. I haven't seen the and then Leon was like, I know what that is. It's a safe ass car. <laughs> Volva's the one Volva's the one that made me laugh. And I do I do wonder if any of those words uh, are allowed to be said in the state of Florida. Any one of them. <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, I we might have to bleep all of those out now. Uh Stugatz, I am having trouble, as many people are, because uh when, Look at you. When Billy, <laughs> when Billy says he is all about accuracy, I feel like it's harder to be accurate than it has been in a while because I'm watching Drake May throw a ball effortlessly 80 yards and I have to go around the room and ask everybody, is this a real thing or is this like what they did with Michael Vick in a Nike commercial many years ago where he threw a ball out of a stadium because everything can be changed by – artificial intelligence that was real that one was real 
Drake May effortlessly throwing the ball 80 yards. I know Caleb Williams and some others aren't going to be throwing at the combine. Drake May clearly will be throwing at the combine if that's what he's going to show off, isn't it? Uh, I, was talking, I was talking about the Vic one, by the way. He's not going to throw at the combine because he released that video and everybody's like, okay, he's got the chooch. We don't need to see him throw. Hmm. That, but the, so we know this video is I'm real. I'm staking my claim that the video is real. Huh. Tony he, told us. Are we getting close to the point where like potential draft prospects could decide to not participate in the combine and release AI videos of themselves doing oh, things they can't actually do? I love that. If there's a way to do it, Braun is going to do it for Bronny soon. <laughs> that's weird. Like that story is weird, right? Yes. Which part of it? Well, where he was like talking up his son and saying he should be drafted high, blah blah blah, whatever. And then as things are playing out, and obviously. You know, his son had a medical issue and like is coming back from that. But as things have played out and people have projected his draft stock falling, now LeBron has pulled a 180 and he's like, why is everybody putting so much pressure on him? He just let him play. And it's like, well, you, you did this. Let him be a normal kid. On March 6th, LeBron tweeted, man, Bronny definitely better than some of these cats I've been watching on League Pass today. Lightweight hilarious. <laughs> no pressure. With laughing emojis. And then... <laughs> Yesterday, can y'all please just let the kid be a kid and enjoy college basketball? <laughs> he can't be a normal kid, Dan. He's LeBron's son. I mean, I don't know what LeBron is doing here because a guy posted a mock draft, had had Bronny going in the second round. And by the way, if I'm the Knicks, I would trade up, get Bronny this year, and I would get LeBron James. I would do that if I'm the Knicks. But a guy did a mock draft, and he had Bronny in the second round, and LeBron commented on that and then deleted the tweet. That's absurd. Like, what are you doing? The reason there's pressure on Bronny is because of you, because you're his dad. And that's okay. It's okay. But you, he's added to the pressure with, I want to play with them. Like, basically telling yes. him, get out of college as fast as you can. because So I, I can play, play with, with you. you. Yeah. It is understandable that all of the internet will fall on the head of America's most famous athlete and, uh, you know, a sports, an American sports internet pioneer in terms of following. Parents make mistakes all the time. It's a fairly regular thing. Being the son of LeBron James in basketball seems like something that would be hard to overcome for any child. Also for a father who wants good things for their child, but also doesn't want to cause things that damage their child. Uh, Bronny evidently, from what people are saying, isn't all that good by pro prospect standards. Right. He, is, uh, he has fallen off some Mac, uh, mock draft boards because he probably will have to wait till 2025 to be pro ready. LeBron is talking now. The reports are that LeBron wants a three-year, nine-figure contract. So that LeBron, somebody's going to pay LeBron James if he wants three years at tens of millions of dollars a year. They're going to pay for the for whatever the LeBron James circus is in his 40s when he wants to play with his son. I understand every criticism of LeBron James. I understand LeBron wanting to play for, with his son. I also understand LeBron not having any idea how to parent this publicly. Like, how many mistakes did you make with some of your first, with your first, anyone listening to I this? I made a ton of with mistakes. With your Dan. first child, yes. with a child. But this set of circumstances where you want to do the best thing for your kid, ensure his future, have him separate and apart from your name when he's going to have, man, do you think it's hard to be Marcus Jordan? Do you think it's hard to be Michael Jordan's kid? Yeah, but Dan, the point is, yes, I made a lot of mistakes. My wife, we made mistakes. We didn't blame others. What, what LeBron is doing is blaming guys who are coming up with mock NBA drafts and coming up with where Bronny's going to fall in said mock NBA drafts. It's not their fault that Bronny's life is difficult. He's it's also, not. Like, he's not running a family business, right? Like, this isn't a paint store that you can hand off to your kid. Like, this is the NBA. You either are good enough or you're not. So, you know, he could be his... It, it obviously is not easy being the son of one of the greatest basketball players of all time, right? But him... Talking his son up as being a great <laughs> prospect, like Bless you'll you. find out if he is or he isn't based on his abilities. And it's no swipe on him; like he just is the basketball player that he is. Jessica, are you over under four sneezes a day? Oh my god, way over. Sorry. I agree with uh, with your point though. Like parenting's really hard, and there and you're if you're a public figure, there's probably things that you would want to take back. All of my dog's IP now belongs to David Sampson. <laughs> I would have changed that if but I he, go back. LeBron just didn't read the room on, okay, I'm the best basketball player of all time. This is going to be so much pressure on this kid. 
if I don't say a word, there's already pressure on him. He's the second best and of all he, time. I, I'm not. You're just saying it was a mistake. He, but and I'm. What am I asking for? He needs to come out and apologize for his mistake. I don't know what I want here, but he just clearly added to the pressure on his kid, and now he's getting mad at the media for stuff that he made more than it needed. Understood, to be. and I understand why it is that everyone likes to blame LeBron and want him to be more accountable at every turn. But any of you, as a parent, if you would have made a child that harm a, a, a mistake that harmed your child. Would you then sit it out after that, or would you try to protect your child? Because I think it's a pretty strong instinct. If your child already has the pressure of you, you've added to the pressure. He's had heart trouble, and now you have to turn on the television and watch your kid get devoured for not being as great as great at basketball. He's not getting devoured. His stock is falling like any other basketball player. I know, but what the judgment on Bronny is – the expectations, because he's your son, arrive in an unreasonable place. You make them worse, even though your life path had you being able to handle all of this at that age in an unprecedented fashion. And now you realize, as the father, oh, my son might not be me. And some of the things that I want to fa- as a father, and not just a father, Stu guys. But a father who's living the life LeBron James has lived for 20 years, where everything is catered to you yeah. at every turn, feeding your selfishness, supporting your selfishness, pulling you away from your kids at every turn because your life is the thing that matters the most to every human being who enters your orbit. I'd have a hard time raising a child under those circumstances and always doing the right public things. That LeBron James has spent 20 years of what has been his public life since 16 navigating this slalom course. It's amazing. Well publicly. And now asking him also do it perfectly on behalf of your son as a father. It's just a tough ask. He's going to make some mistakes. But I think we all agree that it's a difficult ask of LeBron James. I think we all realize we would make similar mistakes to LeBron James, the ones that he is making. But don't blame a guy who's putting up a mock draft. I mean, but, your son should be treated like oh, any other basketball okay, but, player. So, but how do you? In fa- fact, he probably gets perks because he's LeBron's all, son. All fair. Now the question is: You're the dad who's made the mistake. How do you fix it? How do you fix it could, publicly, privately? How do you fix what's, it? What's the mistake? What are we trying to? I don't understand. I'm it's adding not- the pressure, at making. LeBron James' son already had pressure to be great, but when LeBron James notarizes. This guy's already better than NBA players. Yeah, but I think most reasonable people are like, this is just a parent viewing their kid in an unrealistic light. I don't think I don't think people are actually like, oh my God, he's not as good as LeBron said. Let me slide him down on the mock drafts. They're just putting him where he is. They're not being mean to him. Totally fine with that. LeBron thinking that his kid is a lot better yeah. than most people do. That's fine. I mean, that's that's natural. Most and on LeBron's, do that. On LeBron's kids' mine. teams, I'm sure he's the, a lot worse. he was the best player on most of those teams. And like, how many other high school games is LeBron watching? So he's the best player LeBron has seen, but that doesn't mean he's the best player out there. If I'm LeBron, I think we go back to the AI thing. We harness the power of artificial intelligence. We put out clips of Bronny doing things that he's not actually doing, but we pretend that it's actually him. We get him drafted. (laughs) If I'm LeBron, that's how I'm using my fame. That's what he should be doing. If I'm LeBron, I start doing mock drafts, Mm -hmm. and I put Bronny number one in every mock draft. Yeah, Yeah. influencer. You got to put him number three, though. You put him number one, it's like, oh, it's That's the thing. It's like the price is right. This this guy. It's like you can't guess it on the dot. You can't be putting out AI combine videos that are super impressive. They have to be like reasonably impressive if he really wanted to do the right thing for his son he'd buy like a foreign team overseas that doesn't have like a good like tv deal right and then you start doing the ai thing once you send him to usc everybody can see him so if you if he's not really that good you hide him away and you start putting out the fake videos and the fake stats because we saw and paulo torres finds out that that's a thing that happens you just make up stats in the nba and you put that out there for those of you who do not know, uh, that is a Tom Haberstroh story involving uh, the Grizzlies statistician. And yep. uh, Pablo Torre finds out PTFO. he's doing some excellent journalism there. What were the, the what were the most amazing things you learned about the, all of the fraud in the 90s? Well, what was amazing about it is that it seemed like this was all just a marketing ploy. As the Vancouver Grizzlies were a new expansion team, their stat guy got direction from the team that, hey, 
juicing stats here and there while we're at home is okay. So there was an example. Of, he said he was a Lakers fan. And Nick Van Exel ended up in a, in a classic game of his with 23 assists. But when you go back and look at the film, there's an example in the first play of the game where the ball's inbounded to him, and then he gives the ball to Eddie Jones, and that's not on screen. And then Eddie Jones dribbles six times by himself up the court, pump fakes, hits a three, Van Exel gets the assist. So what it says is that while guys were at home, the splits on blocks, on steals, on assists – it was all greater for those teams. So Michael Jordan, when he wins Defensive Player of the Year, mm -hmm. the numbers are a bit juiced by the Chicago statisticians in 88. No, they're not. Okay. Who are we ripping here? Who do we rip? Right. It's a great Everyone question. Everyone from the 90s. No, we don't need to rip anyone. We just That's what LeBron needs to do to be a good parent. Lie about your child. No, and he but did it. No, but, but who's the fraud? Like, whose stats were inflated so much? I just want to rip someone. Who do I rip? Stockton, maybe. Hmm? Stockton was the example that they used. Like, assists. yeah, you give that guy an assist. He's John Stockton. I think what you want to do here, Stugat, so that you can always put yourself in positions to win, I think who you want to rip is LeBron James as a father. I think, <laughs> what you want to do. I think an NBA executive uh, was quoted as saying the upside for Bronny James is Gary Harris, that that is the upside, uh, that is the highest point. And if he makes it to the NBA, Stugat, that by itself is a monumental achievement, whether no he has the, the bloodline or not. To get to the top 1% of the top 1% of there are 450 people in the world that get to play this sport at the top end. If he gets to Gary Harris, Harris, that's gravy. I mean, he's made $100 million in his career. <laughs> that's all that matters, of course. Is uh, I'm just saying, you've made it to the NBA, the highest level of your sport, and Gary Harris will laugh at it because it's LeBron's kid and it's Gary Harris, but Gary Harris is a decent player who made $100 million. But you're right in saying that LeBron James inflated all of the expectations when he said, I'm watching NBA players right now and my son is better than them when he's not. And now you look at his collegiate stats and people have to point out, well, that was, those were Jimmy Butler's collegiate stats at the beginning. Well, yeah, but Jimmy Butler was terrible at the beginning in college. Like you can take, you can find a <laughs> player who had those stats at the beginning. <laughs> but it is, I, I think people underestimate, just like they did this with Cam Newton, where you sort of underestimate how big someone is uh, physically, how they have to be physically in order to be uh, the greatest goal line situation threat in the history of the league, how strong and big the person must be to do that in the NFL. I think we consistently underestimate how good these human beings are, <laughs> as if a holy man reaches into the crib that LeBron James has in his home, and then all you need to do is put that in the pipeline, and it's going to be Gary Harris. Like, there are a lot of things that have to happen other than LeBron James's sperm in your sister. I think what's hard for the kid, for Bronny, is people will think or suggest or ask, did he have to work as hard as every other kid? And if you're projected as a second-round pick in the NBA draft, then you've put the work in. He'll have to deal with that for the remainder of his life. Is it nepotism? Why is he getting these opportunities? But, Dan, I have no doubt. First off, I agree with you. It's difficult to make it to professional sports. Uh, but as it pertains to Bronny, I have no doubt that he has put the work in. He is not getting this because of his father. He is getting this because he put the work in, and he's good enough to be maybe Gary Harris. And that's a decent career. I mean, the counter argument would be you said you would draft LeBron's son just to get LeBron. So you're saying both things. You're saying that he's put in the work and he gets whatever he deserves, but you're also saying I'd take him just to get his dad. He's put I would. He's put enough work in to make it to the NBA. He's put enough work in where some team's gonna draft him. But and why but, not but, but maybe he might get to the NBA just because somebody wants his dad too. Uh, okay. Like, which so. wouldn't be the same amount of work. Like he would have a golden gilded path to the NBA. Not only that too, like every Every step of his basketball life has been helped and aided through LeBron. You're talking about working with the best trainers. You're talking about working with diet, like dieticians. You're talking about working with workout guys that people that are of the general population don't have access to, right? Like I've seen it playing. Hoops How myself. jealous are you so, of it, his regimen I that saw he had it. growing up? Oh, incredible! Like, where would you be if you had it? That's a probably, great question. Probably Gary Harris. Like, <laughs> <laughs> what? I'm going to tell you. A I nice Gary Harris. Harris. Yeah. What? Yeah. But like, when you look at guys that come from those. Uh, families it's like I played with Timmy Hardaway Jr. and like he was doing things when we were in high school that was collegiate and pro level workouts dietitian like he was doing things that we weren't and then it's like you get to a point where 
your natural talent plus the work that you put in at an elite level takes you to another level. And it's just like you can see it with that. So he's probably going to do something good. What We're just going to let Tony say he'd be Gary Harris <laughs> if he had Brody's conditioning The difference program? between you and Tim Hardaway Jr. was not his trainers. What was it? It's all the seed what? oils you ate growing up. That's if you were true. if you had a professional parents in the NBA. I give up. Now I, we're talking. You give up, Billy? No, I didn't give up. Was that was Jeremy. Jeremy gave up. Yeah, I yeah. gave up. Yes. Where would I be if I had his trainers? I think I could go D three. Yeah, I think you're an example of where you'd be. Lipscomb. I made it to D three without his trainers. I'd be at, I'd be playing basketball at Lipscomb. Where Lipscomb is a really you? good school, dude. I think Lipscomb's D one. No, it's, it's just not. a funny name. Yes, it is. <laughs> I can't believe that I'm talking here about how hard it is to get to the NBA. And Tony just said that if he had Tim Hardaway Jr.'s trainers, he would have made a hundred million Bronies. dollars. Timmy's then Timmy's made like two hundred million dollars in his career. Tony, I was right there. Gary Harris, <laughs> one year average seventeen and a half points per game. You're saying know. you would have done that? If I had to grow up oh, that, that oh. Bronny did, I mean, I'd be closer than I would now. Okay, and so I just want to be clear on something. I love you. Guys, Tyler Johnson made $75 million in the NBA. Tyler Johnson was way better at basketball than you. Okay, Jeremy, thank you, buddy. Wow. I mean, just incredible. What? I'm the one who's wrong here? Welcome. Okay, everybody, Every conversation everybody breathe. with him. Everybody breathe. I, I need everybody to breathe here because for all the delusions that we've had around here of Stugat says he would make six threes in an NBA game if he was I played. actually did. I mean, sorry. Not an NBA game. It was a high school game. He did return a serve from a professional tennis player. <laughs> with a cigarette in his mouth. Yep. Try that. From Stugat saying he would make – six NBA threes <laughs> to Greg Cody saying he would hit 180 in the major leagues and that field goal he would have done it if he wouldn't have gotten goal. hurt that yeah, day he pulled a hammy yeah unfortunate don't uh, forget I can throw an orange 100 yards I did not think that the audience could underestimate how hard it is to be these people who play professional sports in a way that was dumber, but to find in our own setting, Tony say, that if he had the trainers because he was working out near Tim Hardaway Jr., he too would have a $100 million <laughs> contract in the NBA. Is is a level of offensive that I cannot abide I like in, in how in how spectacular it is in its ignorance because I, I cannot have these people around me. Stugatz already thinks that if he did anything in the world, he would be exceptional at it. We have diagnosed him with an affliction, a disease, <laughs> Dunning-Kruger effect. Uh -huh. it, we have diagnosed this because he has this. He's a waddling five foot six. <laughs> anything in professional sports would result in him immediately being injured and hospitalized. But okay, I could shoot a me. J. I mean. Meet on me. 6'4". Imagine with that kind of diet, that kind of workout. I'd be an Adonis, Dan. Come on, give me a break. Yeah. I mean, I did get a hit off Matt Latos. Mm -hmm. I mean, Spud Webb was 5'6". Put me around Spud Webb's trainers growing up, and I mean, $100 million. Boom. Tony, I'm going to ask you to go sit in the penalty wow. box. Wow. Uh, for, for being overconfident? This isn't Tony's fault. This having, is like... For having confidence in myself. I'm a dog, Dan. That's falsehood. what you don't get. That's what you don't no. factor into your equation. When no. you're doing the math, oh, it's funny, he's doing this. I'm a dog, Dan. I make that shit happen, dude. I don't think you get that. Dude. I'll leave. I'll leave. No. But I'm a dog, Dan. Dan, this is exactly what LeBron did to Bronny. Like, what you've done with Tony. Is you've enabled him to think that he's a second round Bad pick. Bad parenting. It's, yeah. this, I don't want to put the blame on you, but like... Apologize, that's Dan. Why he's here? You said, "Look at the people around me." Like Tony's here, and you just encouraged him this whole time. I was getting a lecture before the show started about how I wasn't supported enough of Tony's 800 game hitting streak situation. Oh, that was actually a pretty good topic, though. <laughs> what is that? A dog barking. I was a little slow on that. Oh, because Tony's a, a dog. Apparently, the Sabermetrics community on Reddit is real excited okay, about it. Tony I'm, was sure to tell us. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and set this up while he's away, and I'm going to explain what's happening in the audience. And uh, we have reached official, official problem status in the relationship with <laughs> Billy and Tony. Because Tony is I now— I think I'm fine. Uh-huh. <laughs> 
He's threatened to strangle you twice today. That's, That's right. fine. I mean, go ahead. Well, this is where we've escalated to. Uh, Tony has uh, threatened to strangle Billy twice today and once in Vegas. And I'm going to explain to the audience why uh, once in Vegas uh, Billy threatened to strangle Tony. I'm sorry, Tony threatened to strangle Correct. Billy. Uh, Tony had flew to Vegas with a file of carefully prepared material that he had worked 10 days workshopping all around the offices here. And every time he presented the topic to anyone, uh, roaring laughter, uh, engaging debate uh, started. Uh, and he has now taken great pride in the sabermetrics co uh, community, has grabbed his hypothetical question, which is the following. A baseball player in the major leagues goes one for four in every single game for many years. Is he a Hall of Fame? Five years. Five years, five exactly. Years. Yes. So he has a five-year hitting streak. 800 games. 800 games, but never has any extra base hits. <laughs> no home runs. No home runs. So it's just 250 average, 250 on With base. a single. Every All game. singles. Yep. It was a single that was added to this? Mm -hmm. That's even worse. What what he said is not only that it was a single, uh, there there were no home runs. I think no all it runs. ever was is he'd right. go one for four with a single in every single game. Would that player with an 800-game hitting streak make the Hall of Fame? Yes. I'm on r slash Sabermetrics right now, the subreddit for Sabermetrics. The commenters don't seem to think this person is a Hall of Famer. Yeah. They're right. I well, think. he can come and he can... I guess. Oh, he's gonna he'll be he'll, he'll be back he'll be back in a second. But let's explain to the audience how you undermined him because again I, did know I saw it I saw it happening. Things. Every room he left was roaring with laughter and yeah. argument. It was he it was the best that Tony brought to Vegas. That's absolutely right. <laughs> but and he did it too often. But it, it was a never... comedian telling the same joke but, every single day in every single conversation. So when you hear for the seventieth hey, time, you're like, crazy. guy, Billy, you got never crazy. and like I just like to also minutes? if if I can, I'd I'd also like to say you guys just got a glimpse into what every conversation with Tony is. It's I'd be Tim Hardaway Jr. if I had this trainer. And you're like he said, Gary exhausting. Harris, Billy, but we never talked about it on air. So the audience was hearing it for the first time. And so, Billy on air, on stage in Vegas. I don't remember. You must have set it up with this is a break glass, an emergency topic. Yeah. And Billy hit a cut, a very cutting. Do you have any more glass to break, Dan? Yeah. Well, I don't. Where would if if I may ask, where was all the support for Tony to keep the conversation going? Because there was dead air, so I had to say something. I don't think it was. I don't remember exactly. Tony, uh, you are now. You've returned. How are you feeling in general about the support you got from Billy in this what circumstance? What support, Dan? What support? Because I was in there. You sent me to the penalty box. Okay, and then we bring up one of my topics. That I brought that up for you. I teed you up for it. That I was not here for. And then you talked about it for three minutes. I and didn't then I came back, and then I immediately hear. Like it's no. like it's crazy. The top comment on Reddit says a DH with a 500 OPS would be a negative WAR player. On base yeah. percentage of 250 with literally no extra base hits Nerds. would be one of the worst DHs Nerds. in baseball. Nerds. Who cares? 800, 800, 800 game, game hitting streak. streak. You That's can't argue real. with an 800 game hitting streak. Get real. The ball that breaks the record would go to the Hall of Fame. The Their jersey would go to the Hall the of Fame. Player. The player doesn't go to the Hall sure. of Fame. That's 57. Yeah. That's 57 hits. And then he has another 600 and some odd hit. Like, what are to we me, talking about? To me, I'm with Jeremy. There's, It's acknowledged in the Hall of Fame, yes, but, but this guys, player, I, I, I've kind crazy. of, that's where I think it ends. That, That's what happens. That's, you have a whole, like, corner in a room where it's, like, craziest hitting streak you've ever imagined yeah. by a below average player. His name, I don't know, what is his name? Whatever his name yeah, is, it doesn't matter. Yeah, but, yeah, name. but the point is, okay, we had this great thought exercise of all these different things and ideas. It was just something to ponder, Tony. Something Tell to ponder. Him. That's why yes. we have the file, of course. Things, no, we didn't. We pondered it. No, and we, we tried to if make I it a franchise. If I could have laser beamed you like across the entire like hemisphere, box I for charity. Huh. It Come happened on. on stage in front of everybody. Where Tony, not only that, Tony's he's got his best material and he's wearing some sort of fur, and Billy took his knees out immediately. As soon as it started, killed. I'm going to do nothing but support Tony and his bad ideas henceforth, and we'll see where that what takes us. What bad ideas, Billy? What bad ideas? None. Please explain them. They're all good. Thank you. <laughs> Billy. <laughs> I don't like that. Billy, <laughs> I understand why Tony is hurt that you would only support so relentlessly the bad ideas of Greg Cody and Stu Gatz, and then the moment one of his bad, bad ideas. ideas makes an appearance, <laughs> you can't get anywhere near it. You're allergic to it. Do you guys know how this works? <laughs> Do any of you know how this works? 
that was one of my top. No, I'm just saying, like another, like you had like Uber 100%, drivers. hundred percent, yeah, sure. sure. There will right, always be more player. flashy players, but if you have an impact on every game for five years, yes, you'd get my vote. Mm. Now, if we're now if it were just on base, meaning walk or one base, I would start to get a bit more shaky. Mm. Mm. The point is that there was in the Saber Metrics Reddit file, right in the yeah. on the site. Ooh. I don't know if we can screen share it so we can see people. Like, there's like five comments, eight comments, ten upvotes. That's how Reddit works. This one in the Sabermetrics file on, on Reddit has like 300 votes, a bunch of comments. 57 comments. The nerds arguing about... Okay, look at the other one. It ones. has 284 upvotes. Look at the other ones. Please, just explain the other one so people can have it, a reference it, point. Because it sounds like... Tony, it's a good conversation no. starter. In it fairness, is. In fairness to Tony, 57 comments would be one comment more than the longest hit streak in baseball right now. <laughs> it's true. So Imagine 800 comments. An, eight, away. an 800 game hitting streak is hard to ignore. Right? He's right. This <laughs> has Impossible. more engagement than almost every other single post well, I mean, it's, on the Saber Metrics Saber Metrics Reddit. Reddit. He started a conversation. It's, it's a we thing. just pondered. In yeah. February. Everyone's pondering. Important. In yeah. a place, okay, where the smartest minds in baseball go to analyze and look at and research, we made things happen. I don't know why I haven't thought of this earlier. I'm going to text Tim Kirkjian. Hmm. Okay, uh, let's do that. Uh, also, you text can text him, but I feel like his answer has to be definitive, and that that's the final answer. Okay. Uh. Also, text Boog Shambi, please. And, Good calves. And uh, then well, now we need three. Disagree? Now yeah. we need three. Right. So who's our Mike Scher? Mm. Passing. Mm. Passing. Now we have four. Okay. Aberstro. Mm. Mike Scher. No, Mike Scher's too close to the situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Text David, because if not, he's going to get mad that we're talking about baseball. <laughs> talking about <laughs> David would be a good one, though. Uh. Why? Because you feel like he'd agree with you? No, I don't know what he'd say, but he'd have something to say at least. So who are we texting? And who's texting who? Uh, Boog Shambi. We'll, uh, we'll get to that in a second. Boog Shambi, uh, the other day, Stugatz, got embroiled in a conversation that we were having around here. And I'm curious what your take is on this. Because me and Mina Kimes were disagreeing about something. And the internet, uh, Mina Kimes was laughing at me and what it is that I was saying. And the internet swelled behind Mina Kimes to also laugh at me. But I heard from a number of broadcasters, including Boog Chambi, who agreed with me on this subject. Because uh, Mina's retort, and it was a good one to me, wondering if Tom Brady will be exceptional at that broadcasting job at $375 million guaranteed, uh, because the skill set, I believe, is difficult to explain complicated things in tight windows. I believe it's not as easy as people think it is to have chemistry with your partner, and it's why Brady has sat out a year and is practicing and is being very meticulous about how to do this. But Mina Kimes undercut the point I was making by saying, yeah, Tom Brady has a lot of difficulty in football deciding things in two and three seconds quickly when <laughs> faced with complicated <laughs> subject matter. And uh, everyone roared and applauded. What an idiot Dan it's a funny is. line. It's a good comment. No, no, and, right. and agreed with her, but I kept hearing from broadcasters like Boog Shambi saying people are really underestimating how difficult it is to be good and interesting in this job in a way that stands out. You don't get to just sit there because your name is Tom Brady, but you all expect Tom Brady to be great at this? In, in tight windows, you're expecting him to be exceptional. I'm expecting him to be great at it because he's been great at everything he's done his entire life. Life, but I'm with Boog on this. Like, I think it's trickier than most people either realize or they know because Tom Brady wanted to play football his entire life. He never wanted to be a broadcaster, and now he's walking in and he's filling big shoes in Greg Olson, who became exceptional at doing things and making points in very small I'm, windows. I'm surprised so there's no guarantee Brady's going to be great at it. I think he'll be great, but I think broadcasting is really, really I'm hard. I'm just surprised at the number of people who think the skill sets are the same. To be able to break down a defense in three seconds with your eyes and your arm and to be able to do it with your mouth are two different skill sets. Right. There is a difference between what Tom Brady's going to be doing and what Boog does, though. Like, Tom Brady's just commenting on the plays in the game. He doesn't have to keep things moving. But, he's explaining to the layman what it is that he sees as someone who's an expert. But Boog wasn't defending how hard it is to be a play-by-play -play guy. Boog was surprised that the internet took up Mina's side so convincingly on a color analyst just sits there 
and it's easy, right up until people start complaining about all the color analysts they complain about because those are some of the most unpopular people anywhere in sports. Just because he was good at playing great at playing football doesn't mean he'll be great at this. I, I mean, think he might be, but I have no idea. It doesn't it doesn't guarantee that he's going to be great at broadcasting because he made split second decisions as a quarterback in the NFL. Mark Schlereth does this. Stink. Stink. Is Boog one of our five or no? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right yeah, now, right now the be. five is Kirkchen, Passin, Boog, Sure, and then between Adnan and Samson, we'll go Adnan. Okay, good. <laughs> That's a good sample size, I think. Okay. I, I feel good about if we can get a definitive yeah. answer out of those five people, I trust it, and we can put this matter to rest. I have an idea as it relates to Brady in the booth. Belichick has nothing to do. Now, I'd like to have him weekly on God Bless Football. We should make a call, but we're not going to do that. I think Belichick and Brady in the same booth would be fantastic. You like that? Aren't they like not getting along great at the moment? Uh, There's some like kind of. You need weird some tension feelings. in the booth. That's okay. A little tension. A little they, too much like murmur. It needs to be clear. I feel like Belichick. Those are great play by Mumbling. I watched him, but the Belichick and Saban like documentary. I I like them both. Same. Uh, Belichick and Saban, great. That. Great chemistry. Make that a booth. Not Belichick and Brady? I want Belichick and Saban. Yeah, I'd watch them because they're friends. They like to get – I feel like they'd get like, – They'd get you, silly together. Exactly. That's it. The silliness. That's what we need out of them. So, got Brady and Belichick spent 20 years at microphones never saying anything interesting. Means fact, they have a lot to say. On purpose, though. Right. They chose to yes. not say anything. Mm -hmm. That's when they had something to gain, Dan. Now, you know, all bets are off. They're just getting silly together. Some silly willies. <laughs> I would say – that it'd be great uh the degree of difficulty on spending 20 years in front of microphones and never saying anything interesting is harder than being interesting always at a microphone <laughs> so you guys now want in a booth two people who are famously guarded famously careful famously uninteresting in their speech. That was yeah. different versions. This is going to be Nikki Saban and Silly Billy Belichick. Tell me if it's <laughs> Belichick and Brady in the booth together. You would watch first week, week one, Dan, you would watch the Cardinals take on the Tennessee Titans. Uh, first you week would. of any television show that's ever started nationally when George Clooney is the opening guest and then they get into week uh, three and it's a cooking chef from around the corner. But what if it's great? Uh, I mean, <laughs> I mean the what? The, the well, I watched the first time is not an enduring standard for whether it will be good. Also, if I lit somebody on fire the first time, they would also watch. But it's a Cardinals-Titans game. <laughs> you wouldn't watch a Belichick and Saban Manning cast with like a, a host that they find like the Jerky Boys hosting? I don't know what you guys are doing with the razzmatazz effervescence of Brady and Belichick speaking and being entertaining at things other than being football people who are doing the football, not talking about the football, because neither one of them has ever said anything when talking about the football that you remember. That's, that Well, hold on a second. Tom Brady was trying to study to be a stand-up comic, was he not? So, like, he clearly has the personality. Do we not think so? He clearly has the personality. Yeah, he was going to be, be a stand-up comedian. And everyone who played for Belichick says there's a wacky side to yeah. Bill Belichick. Don't you want to see it? Nick Saban used to drive and throw all of his players off the boats at the lake. <laughs> like these nuts jokes. But Belichick liked the jerky boys and the prank calls. These are some wacky dudes. They just got to, you know, find the right place to do it. Give them a chance. Why don't we give them a chance? What are we doing? Well, you shook your head when Stugat said we're trying to get Belichick every week. Well, that's because God I've endured football. so many lacrosse coaches with the promise of he's going to join to talk lacrosse. And <laughs> never has he joined, obviously. And I'm just stuck in a lacrosse Zoom for the 60th time. Do you have the biggest cringe you've ever had when it comes to Stugat getting people on and asking them for stuff? Do you have one no, that stands I, no. out to you? They're all, it's all like, yes, I'm like a victim of this crime multiple times. They all blend together. Tony is still fighting with the shipping container over the Gary Harris thing. Everyone's yelling at him. He's never felt more alone uh, than he does. Uh, this is today. normal. This is normal, Dan. I'm alone. This is what I usually go through. What I was explaining to Jess because she was talking about there he goes. like rich, rich families that have access to these trainers and dietitians and workout plans and all that stuff. That's not what I'm saying. We I'm all saying, we were saying that we all know a bunch of kids that have had money and sure, tried to sure. have training. What I'm talking about is Here professional athletes, kids. 
So when you have a dad or mom who's been a professional athlete and knows what it takes to get to a certain level, they can help you in a way that if you have a dork billionaire dad who doesn't know sports, how is he going to help you? No, like it doesn't work that way. Mm. That That's fine. All of that the can be so. All you of... saw me very animated about yeah. that, Dan. Yeah. That's what it was. My I'll argument that. is that there's a lot of rich people whose kids don't make it in professional sure. sports because to an extent, you either have it or you don't. But sure. Tony agrees with that. Sure. Uh, my argument is. Thank you, is Billy, for oh. agreeing with Tony today solely that it's harder than you guys think to get to the top of being paid to play. Ask Bronny. That's my point. (laughs) Uh, Regardless. It's hard to get to D3 and play sports. Uh, Less hard. Vastly Uh, less hard. Also, Dan, another update. I have sent the five texts out to our baseball experts. I have heard back from a few. I'm not going to give it any way. I, I want to hear, even though Boog's never going to respond to me. He doesn't really respond to me. So mm. I have four responses of the five. And uh, would you like? We, no, I no, just, no. Wait. Dan, text Boog right now. Yeah, Tell him right. respond to Chris Cody. We need all five. In case there's a tiebreaker situation, he knows what if, if there's a tie or not. I could tell you if there is. is Does there, that matter? Do, do we is need Boog's answer? We don't need Boog's answer. <gasps> okay, wow. so then we could just do it now. Mm. Yeah. Wait, what do you think, Tony? I'm could be guessing, a hung jury. I, no, I'm guessing it's going to be consensus that that is not a Hall of Famer. Agreed. From we should save it their, for the last segment. Yes, we're going to wait. We're going to tease it out. In in CSL. In the meantime, what we're going to in the try meantime. to do. You guys need to interrupt me just a little more today. Just <laughs> a little that. more today. Yeah, yeah, well, Stugatz is right, by the way. I got a bunch of D3 offers, so but that shows sure, you how difficult that is. Make sure to do it with time spent listening jokes. TSL. That's the, that's the best way to do it. Uh, Jamel Hill is joining us now because I am desperate to go viral in this costume with serious subject matter. And I want to ask her some serious questions, but I also want to ask her a handful of silly questions. And I've got a shameful admission to make. Huh. Shameful admission for a 55-year-old to make, which is I did not know that the Clippers were a boat until I saw the new uniform dis- design the other day. Wow. I learned that the other day. I'm learning I'm, it now. And I'm, I'm <laughs> and I'm ashamed of it. Surely on the West Coast, uh, Jamel, this is not any kind of news to you. You're judging me as a fellow journalist for my ignorance. This is the height of privilege that I don't know this already, correct? And I'm allowed to not know basic things that people are supposed to know in sports. Uh, Dan, I'm judging you for a lot of things right now, <laughs> the least of which is the Clippers, which I didn't know either. I, I didn't. I found out as soon as you just said it right now. I had no idea. I've only been living out in L.A. It'll be six years this year, so I'm not deeply embedded enough, clearly, to know what the Clippers, what their, what their nickname actually stood for. I am stunned by that. Put it on the poll, please, at Levitard Show. Did you know the Clippers were a boat before their recent uniform unveil? Yes or no? I knew because of the Fort Lauderdale Hotel, the, the, Yankee, the Clipper. Yankee Clipper. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we will find out whether the audience knew that or not. But there is a lot of stuff that I want to talk about with Jamel Hill. And I will tell you, Jamel Hill is Unbothered is a podcast and a YouTube celebration that you should enjoy. Uh, It's Jamel Hill on YouTube, at It's Jamel Hill on YouTube. And she's got Mary J. Blige and Method Man on Jamel Hill is Unbothered. Uh, Did you uncover any of the good stuff with uh, them? You've gotten a lot of guests here that are top end on Jamel Hill is Unbothered. You're really enjoying this project, I would imagine. What did those two, I mean, these are two life, these are two people you've wanted to talk to your entire life, right? Yeah, I mean, Mary J. Blige is probably, you know, for for my generation, I mean, she's probably the number one uh, female R&B artist, um, you know, for a lot of us. I literally feel like I grew up with this woman because when her, her first album dropped, I was a senior in high school. And so um, her, when her second album, My Life, dropped, I was in college. So all the heartache she discussed in this album, I could sort of relate to at that point and stage uh, in my life. But um, the beauty of these two, uh, Mary J and, and Method Man, is that I, I was able to to sort of get linked in into the power universe. So I actually spent many hours on set uh, with Mary J and Method Man because I had a scene with them where I was, of course, playing my favorite character, which is myself. That's always a, that's always a great character to play. They always, whenever they need a reporter, they may need me to do a cameo. Somehow that became my role in the power universe. But that was really special for me because had you told me as a youngster growing up in Detroit, that the literal poster on my wall in Mary J. Blige, someday I would not only share a set with her, but get a chance to interview her. I, you know, I, I just never would have believed it. 
Power is a guilty pleasure for me. Is it uh, still strong after all of these years? The books are kind of weird. Oh, the spin- this, not the spinoffs have been great, I think. I mean, especially hers. You What? The original, uh, the original five or six seasons of Power were excellent. Then once they started doing the spinoffs, I was just like, eh, he kind of lost me. Yeah, well. I need ghosts. I thought, you need <laughs> See, I at first I felt that I felt that way, and then with Raising Canning, which I think is like really well done, uh, that one Power Force, um, featuring you know the uh, Joseph Segura who plays uh, Tommy, and even this one, you know, it goes to like I, I think they've done a, as good a, of a job as you could building an entire universe without sort of the main character that created all of this. So I I, I love it, but Dan, I, I gotta even deeper guilty pleasure and um i i got a chance to record something about it for yesterday so i'm all in on Tubi hive like Tubi has me i'm fighting for my life with this fast channel i don't know how it came to be but it has such eloquent cinema on there that is all rooted a lot of it is rooted in detroit and a lot of it is it's, it's real hood i'm not i'm not gonna hold you up it's very it's very very hood and it has me right now. It has a it has a lock on me, Dan. I need to I need to get out of this Tubi Hive because before I look up and know it, I watch like seven or eight Tubi movies, and I don't know what happened to all of my day because I'm so invested in this network now. It is getting harder and harder to not get addicted to some of these uh, candy sugar things that end up with you getting <sighs> lost in some of these places. Uh, Billy was arguing earlier. He was saying also because we can't figure out what's real or not real on the Internet. He's saying this is the single best time in the history of America to be a skeptic. Uh, that, uh, <laughs> but, He's not wrong. Uh, I mean. Yeah, Put it on the poll, please. Is this the best time in the history of America to be a skeptic? But I wanted to talk to you about something serious here, uh, Jamel, because these things happen pretty slowly to the tearing down uh, when we find out that people that we loved once upon a time, uh, R. Kelly, uh, Bill Cosby, Harvey Weinstein, these things don't happen quickly. And it would appear that Diddy right now is in the middle of this happening uh, and it, it it feels like he's about to uh, have a whole lot of people come forward with the freedom to not be afraid of his money and his power. So what do you think is happening here and is going to happen with Diddy? Well, I think once the floodgates were sort of open with his um, ex, Cassie, uh, coming out with the allegations that she did, which were very serious, very, um, you know, they were damning, and, uh, you know, to, to be totally honest. I think as we see the, the the pattern with all of these cases, it takes one person, that person has the bravery and the courage to come forward. And then suddenly you hear many, many stories and, um, or you have many allegations that surface. And I think uh, with Diddy, uh, usually a lot of times with these people, I, I can say this was the case with Harvey Weinstein because like, I'm not embedded enough in that world to know, but I know that in general, when it comes to these accusations finally coming to light, they have been the subject of whispers for many, many years. So these are, you may now be finding out the gory, awful, uh, tragic, horrible details, but there's always been a lot of whispers around some of these people that when we finally sort of understand the depth of what the allegations are against them, it can be jarring to a lot of people because a lot of people have put people like him and the people you mentioned, Bill Cosby, they put them on pedestals. These are people who have been entertaining us for decades, not just one or two years. And so at this point, I don't know why we continue to put these people on pedestals or why we continue to act surprised and stunned when more often than not, the combination of power, uh, money, of, of being completely unchecked and having enablers it typically does not lead to the greatest of behaviors. And they don't all have to be as serious as the allegations against Diddy, but they typically don't lead to the best behaviors in people. I'm not saying that we should not allow ourselves um, the luxury of entertainment. What I am saying, and to some degree, we actually see this with Cam Newton, and trust me, I, I can lick it there, is that every time we elevate people who are in celebrity positions beyond the station of just being people who entertain us, we find out every single time that your faves are problematic. 
you don't expect him to keep his freedom, right? Like, I mean, we can all do innocent until proven guilty, but there's so much here, and it's been talked about for so long. You expect Diddy to be able to survive this with his freedom? Um, I actually do, um, but I, I think his reputation is, the damage is irreversible. Um, you know, when you think about how he was moving in the business world, I don't think anybody in their right mind wants to do business with, with Diddy. And it's it's only unfortunate in these in this way. And I'm not saying that this should be a reason that people feel any sympathy whatsoever for him. But usually these people have built an entire economy around what they do. And so it's not just about Diddy. It's about the people that have become um, sort of part of the, the empire he's built. Like I think about Revolt. I know a lot of people who work over at Revolt. These are really good, talented people. And I'm wondering like what's going to happen to them because of all of this, because anything right now with Diddy's name on it is toxic. So it's not just about him. He's sinking everything that he's been attached to. And so um, I expect him to maybe survive with his freedom, but his reputation is, is gone. And if he had any higher aspirations in business, I just don't see how that's even remotely possible now. As a veteran of journalism who's not often surprised by things, and for those who do not know, what are the worst of the details when you're reading through this and you're like, oh, my God, I, I, this surprises even me, even though I've seen just about everything here? Well, so I, I think people are sort of having the wrong conversation, is that they have made this about Diddy's sexuality, whatever that may be. It is not about Diddy's sexuality. It's about whether or not he abused his power, whether or not he committed a crime, and whether or not he was assaulting and 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 has this awful track record of abusing young women. That's what this is about. That's where our outrage and shock should be directed toward, is that. Not toward who it was. Who it was doesn't matter. The method and how he operated is what matters. And so I think um, the violence of it, um, because, you know, while there, uh, you know, there's been certain incidents that Diddy has been alleged to have done or whatever, I don't think that people necessarily looked at him as having this violent persona. And so hearing about some of these details, that part of it, and I, I just think the depravity of, of all of it, um, to want, if there is, if there's any possibility um, that he could have really hurt some people you know, not just emotionally, but physically. I mean, that all of that is just very sickening, um, you know, to me. And unfortunately, as a result, then you see why we need to have more conversations around educating people about sexual assault. So that sort of the, the, the ignorance factor of all of this and how we're processing it, that part I'm always disappointed in. You mentioned Cam Newton, linking it to Cam Newton. What were your takeaways that were most interesting on the Cam Newton fight? Okay, so Cam Newton, <laughs> one, uh, we reached the point of the plot, Dan, that uh, after somebody put their paws on us, suddenly we're on a podcast talking about it. I just know if somebody that had drugged me that was six feet six tall, uh, me and um, you know, some of my friends or whatever, I don't know if I'd be doing a media tour to talk about how that happened to me. There's a lot of disappointing things. And one of the things that come out about this in the aftermath of this conversation is how Black people talk about other Black people when these situation arises. This is when your neighborhood friendly race lady shows up. Is Hold on a second. There is Hold on just a second. <laughs> <laughs> it's time for your friendly neighborhood race lady. You're good. All right. Now, because I, I can't have the racial take unless I have the music. Correct. So uh, there is, uh, you see when black people, when others who are not black try to make black people into a monolithic people, meaning that if one of us does something, it somehow reflects on the entire race we lose it. We understandably lose it because that doesn't, that very rarely happens to, to other races to some, to some degree. It does, it does happen a little bit, but I feel like with a degree when it comes to black people, it's, it's far deeper. And yet I have heard over and over on social media, people saying, black people saying the same thing that we get outraged about that white people say about our community. 
So suddenly this is not just a combination of ego and um, uh, and bravado gone wrong and tempers flaring and trash talk and all that, just a singular incident. Suddenly this is the reason why black people can't have nothing. And I just reject that so much on, on all levels is that, you know, Cam shouldn't come back in the community. That's why he shouldn't deal with us. And that's why black people can't do this. Whoa, 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 whoa. This is about some immaturity that took place on both sides, I might mention, because, you know, people are, are sort of focused so much on Cam winning the fight. And I'm not blaming him for this incident because it looked like, again, there was blame on both sides to be had. Mostly I'm just like, you guys are in the presence of kids. And I thought the point of the exercise with this tournament was to expose them to somebody who has been as professionally successful as Cam, who can help them understand what it takes to get to the next level. And, and as coaches in the position of leading young men, you got to know better than to do this. And so there's that part of the conversation. But I really hate how this has become the lecturing of Black people, mostly by other Black people who are saying that we have embarrassed our entire race by this one incident. And I hate that we more than anybody else subscribe to that same thinking. It's just that automatic reflexive recoil that we have when something bad happens nationally and we find out that the person who did it was Black. And suddenly we all feel this sort of secondhand embarrassment that somebody got out there and acted a fool. And I started... I started to leave that thinking away a long time ago. And so I, because then you make it seem like the behavior is pathological and not just the actions of these individuals. Cause that's how I took it. They reflect me no more than, uh, you know, if uh, some celebrity that's black wins an award. And so we can't play that game. And so it's disappointing to find a lot of us sort of trafficking in those same stereotypes that we get outraged by when other people say it. Walk me through two parts of this culturally, because Shannon Sharp is blowing up now in the business, and he's one of the people who said that this is wildly disrespectful, and it would never happen at Peyton Manning's camp or Tom Brady's camp. But you're talking about how people talk about the incident afterward. How about beforehand, when I ask you about Rucker Park or And One and the idea of talking trash uh, before you arrive at Cam Newton's camp because you think you can do something against Cam Newton and, and where words can escalate into what it is that we saw because you're disrespecting Cam Newton and he's only going to abide so much disrespect at his camp. Well, exactly. But at least the way they told it, and I don't know, you know, at this point, it's a, it's a, it's a game of who do you believe, but the trash talking seemed to be mutual on both sides. Now, like trash talking is not a gateway to always leading to something violent happening. But again, when you put that type of trash talk, and I think somebody, because in general, um, there is a delusional quality in a lot of men who think that they are, that physically, that they can, um, you know, uh, that, that they can, they can be sized up against a professional athlete. There's just a bravado in being about that anyway. And so then you get the extra bravado. Yeah, because y'all, look, if there's one thing a man will find, it's definitely delusion when it comes to how they <laughs> stack up against professional athletes. You hear it all? I mean, you see it all, all the time. Every day. Media. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, uh, when you're, si when you're the same size, it's a different story, though. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm just saying it's only men that are having these conversations about whether or not they can they can fight a bear. It's like, wh why do y'all believe this? I don't, I don't if know. If you had the I right trainers, this. though, Jamel. Right. See what I'm saying? <laughs> you do it. You're, you're so delusional. Like, the number, I think it was that survey that came out not too long ago about the number of men who think they can land a plane, a land a plane safely, I can also having do never flown. <laughs> <laughs> Jamel, here's the thing. Here's what you don't know. When you Tony fly, has literally when said When you that. fly to Bimini, Jamel, the, the pilots are right in front of you because it's a small plane, right? So there's no cockpit, there's no covering. So if that if that pilot goes down, guess who the co-pilot is? You look around and you don't find him, it's you. That doesn't mean you're landing He's the plane. Right. Yeah, Tony's right. a good point. Exactly. I would land that son of a bitch. <laughs> Once again, the delusion of men. I, I, look, just give me the confidence of the average man when it comes to whether or not that they think that they could measure up to a professional athlete. So you have all of this hubris, this ego, you know, it's been a part of like the, as you mentioned, the Rucker Park tradition in general, there is something to be said for like, hey, people wanting to see if they belong on the same field or be in the same company as some of these athletes. And this is just a situation that got out of hand, no more, no less. And as far as what Shannon said, that's what I mean 
to make it seem like it's pathological. And I think those, I, I love Shannon, reasonable minds can differ. And I think that's dangerous thinking to put out there because it's making it seem as if only Black people are inherently attracted to confrontation and disrespect. And we know that's not true. I could beat Alex Morgan one on one. <laughs> Don't tell me I can't challenge someone just because I'm a woman, Jamel. I mean, I'm just saying, look, I, I'd love to see us get that same level of, of toxicity. I, so that's my, I, I encourage women, we need to be more toxic in this way. I need to be able to have the confidence to roll up to Serena Williams and say I could beat her in one set of tennis. <laughs> Do you play tennis, though? I feel like I would be good at it. Because that's what y'all So you haven't played yet. (laughs) You don't start with a full set, Jamel. You say, hey, I can get a game off Serena Williams. That's Oh, oh, yeah, you're right. Right, Okay, I got to start smaller than that. I can get a game (laughs) off of Serena Williams. It's like the athlete y'all think y'all are in your head and in your couch versus what you actually are is truly hysterical. (laughs) That was your friendly neighborhood race lady. Uh, Jamel, always nice seeing you. Thank you for stopping through. We always appreciate it. Yeah, I can't believe I did this whole thing and I didn't ask you why you're dressed in in sort of like a masked adult diaper, but that's okay. I uh, I, just, I just I just like it. I run my own company now, and I can I can adhere to all of my personal it's a kinks. Kink. Yeah, personal okay. kinks. Thank you. Oh, okay, I love it. No make, judgment. Okay. I, I, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. I make my own rules in my own workplace. Uh, I wanted to uh, thank you, Jamel. Appreciate it. I wanted to get to something here, Stugatz, because I've been talking for a while, many years and many successive weeks about John Stewart and what I hope for John Stewart in his return uh, to The Daily Show. And so far... In the first three episodes, it's exceeded all expectations in a time where it's impossible to get ratings. And it's better than ever to be a skeptic. I don't believe any of the ratings. But everyone seems to be saying that not only is uh, The Daily Show doing better numbers than it has done since Jon Stewart left, but also all of the other hosts are getting a ratings bump from the fact that Jon Stewart has merely done three episodes so far, and he's touched a lot of people with politics, but I'm going to play some sound for you in the next segment of him really moving Stugatz. The dog lover constituency, I think Michael Vick wildly underestimated the damage that can be done by outraged dog owners. And Jon Stewart has uh, connected with a human moment of breaking down on air because he did the show the other day, a show I will repeat and continue to tell people, uh, takes 60, 70, 80 hours of bandwidth a week from Jon Stewart to get up there on Mondays and do what he's trying to do during an election year, which is stay relevant in political comedy, Not age out of political comedy because it's a totally different time than the one he dominated. Jon Stewart, what he's doing on Mondays is important and three episodes in is also working because he's he's drawing millions of people at a time that nobody draws millions of people to a single, you know, to a single time. We all have our own menus. Why are you shaking your head, uh, Chris? This room just exploded with debate on Skeptical Billy came out on how how many hours he's really putting into this. It's not 80 hours a week for a 24 minute episode. Come on, what are we doing? That's crazy. 80 to 90. He's writers, maybe. Could be 90. What do you think? uh, How hard? 24 minutes, not 80 hours a week. Not not. Finger guns in. What are we talking about today, boys? All right, let's do it. Yeah, we agreed on like 30 back here. Yeah, you guys have no earthly idea how difficult it is to do these things well at the do level. Do it five yeah, days we a week. Produce it. That John Oliver and John Stewart do it. Like you just I wish t- I was in the entertainment business. You, you, yeah, you, it'd be really hard. I wonder how it how it works to produce a show. What do producers even do? A good one. A good one That's is the difference. the part you guys are missing. I used to. <laughs> Ah, that's right. It is time for Against the Spread. Against the Spread is sponsored by DraftKings. Stay tuned, because you'll hear more about DraftKings and all it has to offer throughout the show. DraftKings. 
the crown is yours. Let's start with my man, Tony. Thank you, Chris. We are going to the association tonight. Battle for LA Dano. Lakers versus the Clippers. Clippers at home on this one. The boats. Yeah. The Yankee Clippers. Uh, minus three and a half for the Clippers. I'm going to take the Clippers to cover against the spread. Against the spread. Against the spread. Jer Bear. I'm going to college basketball. Um, and there's a blue blood program playing tonight at Oklahoma UCF. State. UCF. UCF. Plus two. Men's basketball. Against the spread. Jessica. Letdown game for the Cavs tonight against my Chicago Bulls. Bulls plus five against the so spread. Billy's Cavs. So Over to you, Billy. All right, I'm headed back to college basketball where Army West Point is a plus four against American. I'm going to take Army West Point plus four. TYFYS. Oh, I got the spread. Over to the spread. Over the spread. I'm going back to the association. Ooh. How about that? No one believes in the Cavaliers. I believe in the Cavaliers. I'm going head to head with you, Jess. I am taking Donovan Mitchell and the Cavs minus five at Chicago. Oh, Again, okay. the spread. spread. Bring us home, Dano. I will take the Timberwolves minus 12 and a half at home against the. Oh, against the spread. Against the spread. Against, against two. Against the Memphis Grizzlies. Actually, minus 12, actually. Yeah. About the half point. Against yeah. the Grizzlies. Spread. I made it even more difficult. Against the spread. Than I needed to. <laughs> That's how luck. little I believe in the Memphis Grizzlies. Uh, I want to play this sound, even though it's sad sound, and uh, already that I'm leaving. Jessica has alerted me that she's leaving the room. I love sad dog stories. You do? Yep. No one does. Who loves sad dogs? The room dogs? wanted to leave. I'm so sagging. when Dan was talking about driving with his dead dog in his lap, you enjoyed that. You know this role in this chair is? Give the show what it needs. <laughs> I'm into this story. Can't wait for it. Team player, Chris. So what I was saying earlier, John Stewart is trying to cross the political divide, and that one's going to be really hard because we're super divided. He is very good at self-deprecating humor. But I think, Stu God, this connects. Maybe it just connects with human beings who are pet owners of any kind maybe it's, it's something <laughs> something that is mocked by people who don't care about animals i don't believe we've done a lot more offensive around here recently than the way you guys broke the news of that owl dying yesterday to ron mcgill and then gracelessly handled the, the aftermath of that afterward flacco what uh, owl yeah you guys were mean Elite. it's an owl cruel uh, but let's listen to this sound of John Stewart connecting in a place where pet owners are going to understand. Uh, they brought out this one-ish year old brindle pit bull uh, who... Uh, <laughs> hit, hit, hit my car in Brooklyn and lost his right leg. I thought I'd get further. <laughs> Um, so it was a perfect idea. They put the dog in my lap and, uh, we left that day feeling really good that we'd helped this great organization. And we also left with this, this one-ish year old brindle pit bull. We called him Tipper. And, uh, in a world of good boys, he was the best. Um, he used to come to the Daily Show every day. He was part of the OG Daily Show dog crew. <laughs> Parker, Quali, Dipper, Riot, they were, they were the OGs in the office. Um, and they were, Dipper would wait, and we'd come and tape the show, and Dipper would wait for me uh, to be done. And uh, he met actors and authors and, Presidents and kings, and he did, he did what the Taliban could not do, which is put a scare into Malala Yousafzai. Oh, dear, you're wrong. Sorry, Malala. It's okay. Dipper passed away yesterday. Aww. He was ready. He was tired. But I wasn't. And the family, we were all together. Thank goodness we were all with him. But boy, my wish for you is 
one day you find that dog, that one dog, it just is the best. Here's your moment to see. Dude, where'd you get your ball, dude? Where's your ball? Get your ball. The skeptics lane is open to both Billy and Chris on that didn't take 80 hours to produce. Took nine. You were, that's the joke we were going to go with, yeah. <laughs> 14 that time. That was like a 14, 14 hours. yeah. And then you cut out the 24-minute episode, four minutes about your dog because the long pauses. I mean, you're really doing a 19-minute show last week. Have you ever cried over someone else's dog? It was his dog. It was his dog. No, but he's asking, he's asking if someone else is feeling that pain, do you ever cry with them because you feel their pain or feel or get the reminder of what your pain was when you lost your dog? I used to mock people who got so upset after losing their dog until I got a dog and became a dog owner. Yeah, but I have the healthy relationship for it. I cried when my dog died, but I just know no one else is going to feel that way. Like, I felt just... bad for Scott Van Pelt, who did his one big thing on SportsCenter about his dog who had just yeah. died. Like, I cried with him. Nothing. I did. I sent no, you him a didn't. text. You're I, right. I, well, I, you I, sent him a text <laughs> saying, can you come on the show yo, to talk about your dog not. dying? Yeah. <laughs> you saw a Talkative yep. chicken over there. It always works. <laughs> I got lost on whose dog it was. Yeah, was like in the beginning, it was like a dog, but then I, was it somebody else's dog? And I didn't. I didn't what? Get it it oh. is sad when dogs die. We can agree on that. I think. Right? Agreed. But Tony and Chris thought it was someone else's dog, and they thought the dog died when it got hit by a car. So they're very confused. Right. During so the tears started then. He's like, hit by a car. I saw tears. I'm like, all right, that's he how lost it died. his leg. But but the same one that lost. And his then leg at the died. end of the story, it was like he died today. Ooh, like, unless what? it was a ghost dog, Tony. Mm. I saw a lot of dogs in New York with three legs, though. What? <laughs> that's no, not I, true. I swear, a I saw a lot. No, I'd say three. At least, because there's so many people walking their dogs. It's a common occurrence. It's there. amazing. I saw one yesterday in Miami. It's amazing how their ability what? to just that, like yeah, the three, dog's normal. I saw. Guys. I actually saw an owner. The dog was sniffing something. I saw an owner give the dog like one of those like yanks. It's like I wouldn't do that to a three-legged dog, but obviously the dog was fine with it. It was just like a normal dog. Like the dog was like, all right, gotta go. Yeah. But. Put it on the poll, Juju, at Levitar. In New York, show. a lot. Are you surprised that no one's reported on the proliferation of three-legged dogs outbreaking all <laughs> over New York? I'm going to see where the biggest population is. <laughs> Jeremy has for us a list of other foreigners who are not in the Hall of Fame, which allows us to play the Paul McCartney sound, the weird Paul McCartney sound again, and we'll get to that in a second. We will also get to Chris Cody has now gotten the official vote on what on – what is a legitimately good question by Tony that Billy sabotaged uh, and has it's lit the sabermetrics community on fire. I do believe that uh, the answer is going to be fairly obvious that you don't want a, a 250 hitter who hits a single oh, and only a single in every game for 800 straight 810 games. game hitting streak means nothing anymore. OK. <laughs> <laughs> He's uh, right. I just want to get that on record. It doesn't mean anything. Gotcha. Okay. It is what they would be saying if they voted no. Yeah. I uh, I also wanted to ask you guys if you're surprised in any way that Todd Gurley, who has not played in, I believe, three or four years, and I know we understand that the running back is largely disposable unless he's Derrick Henry, but that Todd Gurley is younger than Derrick Henry. He's been out of the league for three years. Damn. Uh, and uh, Derrick Henry is going to get another contract at 30. That Super Bowl, quiet as it's kept, like people say, oh, Belichick won that one for Brady when Brady scored 13 points and they were able to beat the Rams. That happened because Todd Gurley wasn't able to play as a not injured player in that game. The Rams offense was totally different without Todd Gurley, but we used up his body, forgot about him. He's been out of the league for three years and he's only 29 years old. Derrick Henry's going to get another free agent contract. I thought for sure the SEC, just the workload in the SEC would make Derrick Henry wear down at some point. But Derrick Henry was still more of a more masculine, stronger than anybody in the league last year. He's just like LeBron of running backs, right? Like every single season, you expect, hey, like this is another year. LeBron's older, maybe some health issues, maybe an injury, and it just doesn't happen. And he just continues well, to get better. But and better I'm going to say he's only 30. It's going to happen very soon. It's it has to happen very soon. To your point, Dan, yeah. maybe he'd still be in the league if his name was Todd Manley. 
You said masculine. Chris said that he knew it. I knew where he was going, and I still couldn't find the sound. <laughs> Did you? you? You know that he is there for you every time. He has the Greg Cody thing where I can kind of tell when he's setting up a terrible I'm winding joke. up. He is the one who's more comfortable than everyone other than Greg Cody about just throwing a turd out there. Like, he's a more... Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and I've thrown some turd at you. I know. When has Greg thrown a turd? All of you are great at throwing turds. Son of a... It's your greatest, it's your greatest skill. <laughs> Is that Paul McCartney? What's he doing here? That is Paul McCartney. <laughs> uh, if you want to get that video, and we've got to get to this vote quickly, but before I do either of those things, I just want to throw to Billy uh, that Sean McDermott has said that it is not a matter of if, but rather when the Bills win the Super Bowl. He said... I think the question is if he will be there when it happens. <laughs> well, th this is the quote. Yes, the joke I was going to make because the quote that he had was if, it's a matter of if, not when, we win the Super Bowl. And my question was going to be, what do you mean by we? <laughs> like, <laughs> who's, who's we? Who's, who's the we in that circumstance? Because you've got one... Who won? You've got one more year. You've got one more year to win a Super Bowl, I'm assuming, even though he's done a great deal of winning, right? He's done... Uh, he's, well, he's got to have. Uh, Bill. It makes me uncomfortable that everyone in here is laughing at this, so I'm going to be the one to sit this out in case we have to play this in the yeah. parade of gas bags <laughs> come a year. It's from a safe now. place to laugh yeah. because you'll be drowned out by the other laughs, so you're good. Okay, don't worry. I mean, it is pretty funny. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that I could say right now that while McDermott has been coaching, he's got the best winning percentage in the league. Not Andy Reid. Uh, classification. I don't know if Sirianni might have an objection to that or not, but I got to think that McDermott's career record is going to be by winning percentage. Since he's been coaching, what, like the coach it, it, stops at as the, the Bills. In since, that, say, I, the Chiefs probably have higher winning I, percentage. I said uh, non Andy Reid okay, division. Cool. Yes. He has a six uh, six forty win percentage, so sixty four win percentage. He's seventy three and forty one as the head coach of the Bills. Their worst year in. 2018 was six and ten. All right, just look up every other coach's for winning percentage. Yeah, you got it. Since I'm Matt, on it. Matt Lafleur is probably pretty high. Sirianni six sixty seven. Lafleur uh, is going to do a lot of winning too. But McDermott has done plenty of winning and is yet viewed as a an underachiever because he hasn't. Uh, you know, he's been 13 seconds slow in one place and uh, lost by a play here. They haven't won the AFC yet. That's right. I'm being told in my ear that Mike Tomlin is just below McDermott. Well, longer. Large. Yeah. Sample size. Sample size. But that's a lot of winning. And we don't think of him as a winner. The Bills. It's uh, not enough winning. It's the wrong winning. You got to win in the right places. Exactly. Do it in the playoffs. Do it against yeah. the Chiefs. Exactly. Exactly. That's where we feel yeah. like the problem is. Like, they're really good, and then they win, and they play the Chiefs, and they lose. Stop letting Joshy down. Don't do that little fake punt thing again. Mm -hmm. I mean, enough with Damar. Chris Cody, what? <laughs> Just a series of Buffalo objections. Uh, Chris, uh, give me the vote finally on what it is that the, all of the people that you texted say of a 800-plus uh, game hitting streak that involves a hitter going one for four in every single game. Is that uh, hitter with an 800-plus game uh, hitting streak a Hall of Fame? Wait, hold on. In Tony's defense, though, like how it was phrased is probably very important. Yeah. So how did you phrase it to them. I phrased it to the uh, same exact question to every person. A DH goes one for four for five straight seasons and then retires. Zero career extra base hits, 250 career batting average, 810 game hitting streak. Is this player a Hall of Famer? Question. That's you didn't ask this to the people you texted, but is this person walking away from an 810 yeah, game hit streak? Yeah, walks away from streak? the game. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Follow up with that and see if walks it away from the anything. game. I think yeah. they got that. Because oh. it's a 810. Retired, 810 is every game that they yeah, would play. Yeah, but okay, retiring and walking away are two different things. Yeah. I'm not going to follow walk up. away with dignity. He hung up the clock. I think they got the laid gist off. of it. Yeah, I different think, things. I don't know if their answers are going to change. Let's go one by one. First person, Jeff Passan, responds, no. Oh. He wow. said, as impressive as an 810-game hitting streak is, a 500 OPS is awful. You can't <laughs> reward someone for being consistently bad. Exactly. Consistently bad? Wow. He's the opposite. He's consistently oh. Getting a hit. He's mm -hmm. consistently okay, is your point. Next response, Adnan Verk. Your guy Taylor asked me this when you were at Super Bowl week. You could have left that out. Is that a yes or a no? And then I was like, and that's all he wrote. And I was like, so what's your answer? <laughs> Afraid of being wrong. Adnan okay. Verk. 
Yes. Wow. Oh. Nothing else but that. My though. guy. I don't have his reasons, but he voted yes. So we are one and one. I think the reason would be the 810 game hit streak. That's true. That's the only reason. <laughs> That would be the what only else? argument. The what else do we have here? I'm I'm riveted. One and one, Dan. All right, Mike Sure. One word response. No. Now what does he know? And then he wrote. It's not a. And then his next text. Well, that that text was one word, and then he responded. <laughs> Would be exciting every time he started a game. 0 for three though. Oh, that's Accurate. true. The intrigue, Dan. The intrigue. He would change Pepito ratings Pepito Pérez is up the bat. What is he going to do? He's going to get hit. He'd be breaking into coverage. The ratings with boom. His SEC bat. football. Oh, my God. You'd be so mad you would hate this player. I would so hate this guy. Yeah. I'm going to kill him. All right. So we have Tim Kirkjian and Boog Shambi. Who, whose results should I read next? It is too far. Is there any You threatened to kill Tony four times today. Every college football game for like five guy. years would get interrupted. Oh, he's the worst. My assumption get him is out of the league. by you asking who you should read next, they both said no. Because if it was yes, then you'd read the well, yes, and then you'd do have Do you want Boogs or out. Tim Kirkjian? Well, he already no, told yeah. us it's not a tie, so we already know what the next Well, Boog didn't respond this. to me. <laughs> Still? So give us Boogs. I kind of gave away the goods. Tim Kirkjian. I, one word response. No. We lose three to one. No follow up. No wins. No nothing? The only yes voter, Adnan. And how credible is he? Can you give me an update, uh, Jeremy, please, on foreigners who are no longer in the Hall of Fame or not in the Hall of Fame? And give me an update on uh, factually what I was saying about McDermott's winning percentage. Well, first on the winning percentage, um, Sean McDermott. 73 and 41 since 2017 when he entered the league. The only teams that are better are the New Orleans Saints, Baltimore Ravens, and Kansas City Chiefs. Obviously, the Saints, Sean Payton, no longer their head coach. So if you're looking for winning percentages in the league amongst coaches, you got Andy Reid. John Harbaugh is the only one you missed. Wow. As for foreigners, Bobby Abreu. Not in the Hall of Fame. Should be in the Hall of Fame. Foreigner, not in the Hall of Fame. Rafael Palmero. Not in the Hall of Fame. What the <laughs> Miguel Tejada. Not in the Hall of Fame. What the <laughs> Louis Tian. Not in the Hall of Fame. What the <laughs> Johan Santana. What the <laughs> And Andrew Jones. <laughs> Chris Cody. What is your problem? You're a beer guy, and your father is a beer guy. You descend from a strong lineage of being beer people. What is your objection to wine people? Well, I have an objection because I, I take offense to what you actually just said. Because, I, yes, I love a, a cold one, a Miller Lite, yeah. like as much as the next one. But I am not one of these. I'm, I'm more going after the enthusiasts. There's beer enthusiasts, these beer, people. Beer guy, they, I'm not. You're a beer I, guy, dude. You don't know it, but you're a beer guy. I know guy. I probably look like one, yeah, but I, I don't like IPAs. Like They fill me up. Like, Just accept I, you're a beer okay, guy. Okay, I mean, I'll, if I had to be... No, if I'm one of these, I'm a liquor guy. I like a good whiskey. Oh, yeah. So I would say beer, Jesus. liquor, oh and wine. Jesus. There are people out here, and I want to dissect who's the worst of this group, because I experienced wine people for the first time. Jesus. Wine people are the worst. They, they're, they're Billy, just boring. Billy, Billy, why are you whispering Jesus on something that only you, Jessica, and Jeremy are laughing about? No, she said it out loud. No one got the else. joke. I didn't I hear hardly her. know her. Liquor guy? Oh. Because I, I said I'm a liquor guy. And, yeah. Liquor, and she said, hell yeah. I don't know. I'm Back in a silly Jess. mood. <laughs> no, but I really want to dissect. Like Saban and Belichick would be if they did a, a little game silly together. Billy. Yeah, we mentioned. <laughs> I literally Billy. want everyone here because, like, you have to have an opinion on this. Who's the worst of this crew? And let me let me make my pitch for why wine people are. It's just boring. Man, like I was at a wine thing at South Beach Food and Wine, and this guy, Dan Costa, spitting fire, looked like a good hang. He hated it because I, I don't know that. He didn't say it. Just a boring, just what's the topography of this dist winer? And I was just like, the most boring. Well, the topography is really important because where the grapes grow, if there's an altitude that's a little bit higher, there's some that's a little bit lower, they get grown in the valley. Like it's a different taste. The I told, are different. I've told you guys this story before. The one class I took in college with the hopes of actually just having it be easy and learning so that I could order the correct wine with a fish and not be an idiot. Was, White wine. Was a wine tasting class. And I walk in and the first class, the instructor reached 
reaches into the jacket of his coat and pulls out a a grape, a, a cluster of grapes and says, by the end of this semester, you'll be able to tell me based on looking on this, what kind of soil this, uh, this was, uh, you know, please tell me, volcanic soil? please tell me you right? dropped the class. I, I struggled. I did not drop. I, I got like a C plus or something and had to fight my way through the class because it was super hard and never got good at ordering wine either. I well, just, you're focused on dirt, it seems like, in this class. It's How does very that important. Help you the dirt's fish? very important. It's what grows the grapes. And so much, like, over laughing. There was one time the guy's like, it was a Pinot Noir tasting. He's just like, you know, you never met a Pinot Noir, and you say to yourself after, needs more oak. And I'm telling you, that crushed. And I'm sitting to my wife, I'm just like, wine humor. I'm like, wine humor over here. Like, I was just like, I'm telling you, and they were, the whole room was like, ah! <laughs> Sounds no, like a real a Weinzenheimer. Of, oh my God, where where was this? That's all. That South Beach food and wine. That's all I learned is that oak is with Pinot Noir. Man, that that's the one thing I took away. It's a lot a, of oak, Asian oak barrels. You know, it's very important. It's a, it's a it's a it's a top flavor for a nice Pinot Noir. Maybe a little leather. Maybe a nice little cherry. Oh maybe a nice dark fruit. He's I right. think I think the debate is between wine people and beer people. I don't have a problem with. Liquor Are there people. beer? Oh, you mean like craft like beer? Enthusiasts, just yeah. people that go and ah. taste different things, and they got to get all the stuff, and it's just they like the really dark yeah. beers. I don't see. Billy says I'm a beer guy. I hate dark beers. Really? I believe wow. that uh, this conversation, like a lot of the ones we have around here, where we're the ones mocking and ignorant, the people who know about these things would object to the amount of mocking ignorance that is in this room because they're aficionados with expertise about how wonderful it is to know the differences between many different wines because the best of the best wine is an ex it's an exceptional experience. And if you know about these things, you would object to everything we're saying here and how dumb we sound and probably uncultured i think chris is referring to the type of person who is like either a wine snob or like a beer hipster like yeah. the person that wants yeah. you to know how expert they are My and i would argue that like almost any topic that person's the worst it yes. doesn't matter if it's beverages sports movies whatever no one likes that guy my brother-in-law is like this with whiskey every yeah. every place we travel i gotta go to a liquor yeah. store and get a local whiskey it's like dude it's it, not the it, knowledge. It burns your throat. It's that it becomes their identity, I think, yeah. is really the, the thing here. I think also we all think of this person as looking like Paul Giamatti from Sideways and condescending us at every turn because they know more about wine than we do. And I'm sitting there looking around like, can I drink all this wine? No one else is drinking all of it. There's one guy who got me. This guy ahead of me, like one row ahead of me, he was crushing every wine. Yeah. But everyone else was just like sipping there. Like at the end of this hour long thing, everyone looked like they still had wine in their glass. And I'm like, what are we doing here, folks? I only drank two of them because I didn't want to be judged. I didn't want like, the way I was judging this guy who crushed all of them. I was like to my wife, I'm like, I'm only drinking these two because I don't want people to be looking at me like this guy's crushing way too much wine. Wine tastings are the best though because you just end up getting hammered. Yep. It was at noon That's too. That's it. That's how, the tip. how is it that, uh, thank you, Jessica, I appreciate that that, that was your They're take. They're like, here's a three ounce pour. <laughs> I'm like, all right, I'll have six of these. Yep. I uh, I do want that to become your signature Arnold Schwarzenegger phrase, where you hit somebody with somebody something, and then you just say, "That's it. That's my take." Just hit Bam. somebody with a sentence, and then knock them over with it. And that's it. That's that's my take. <laughs> that's my voice. Uh, do that. <laughs> you, uh, Chris Cody, uh, you at a uh, wine tasting and a fancy gala of gourmet people being the hotel hall. <laughs> So where did you end up, though, as you tried to taste liberally from uh, the great excesses that are gourmet Miami? Because uh, there were a lot of good places where there were a lot of good parties, and you, uh, you braved all of the traffic and all of the inconvenience to get to one of these crowded spaces. How did you fit in? Because they are a lot of culinary experts. It's not a lot of people just looking for a party. I fit in all right. I, I I think there's there's different kinds of people at these things. There's the people that go to the, every year and that they're the people that I was just complaining about. And then there's the people that are there like me. Like oh, it's a it's a one time exciting thing. So I we mingled with some people, but it's I, it's definitely a vibe over my pay grade for sure. Uh, before we get out of here, can you guys just give me? I heard you talking earlier about Fidel Castro, and I don't know what the story was. Why it is that? Why though? We the, do that. All right. This was so, a wild oh, story. Oh, happening. This is all right. So I I gotta pull up the tweet. Yeah. All right. So there was a uh man. This is with a minute left. There was there was a a a 
parody article. He invented from, the Euro step. Yeah, that's the parody. So there's a parody <laughs> article from Medium uh, where someone – there's photos of Fidel Castro playing basketball. And so uh, it says that through a journal entry by Che Guevara in December of 1962, the quote was, In his frequent basketball matches, Fidel has started using a new move he simply calls the step. It is undeniably effective, yet is his, is its goodness equally undeniable? As revolutionaries, we must not merely pay attention to ends but to means. I worry that this flash and pomp is not befitting of the revolutionary leader. It serves to separate him too much from those caught in the chains of a maudlin life, marred by oppression and economic strife. Yes, There's it leads a to a basket. But at what cost to the communal spirit? And the thing that I loved about it was that everyone said the Eurostep should be called the Cuban Shuffle. That is not Fidel Castro. That's DJ Khaled. And I want you guys to put on the poll, please, at Lebetard Show. Did Fidel Castro invent the Eurostep? That's it. That's the take. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good limited fake Paul McCartney. <laughs> so Heat Wentz has arrived, guys. Heat Wentz. Go on. Uh, Jimmy Butler is the star of the new Fall Out Boy music video. So after the emo Jimmy thing that he did at Media Day back in October, I guess, Fall Out Boy much, must have reached out because Heat Wentz was one of the several nicknames that came for that after his emo haircut. Uh, and now they tweeted it out themselves. In the music video, you've got Jimmy with the emo haircut and all sorts of rhinestones and tassels and cowboy hats uh, looking incredible. And uh, yeah, they said it's the So Much for Stardust music video starring Jimmy Butler, a.k.a. Heat Wentz. Do you demand money if you're Jimmy Butler there? What are you paying me? I mean, I'm sure he got paid for this. Oh, he's a talent fee, baby. You think? Really? Oh, yeah. I could see. This feels like a passion project. Yeah. I mean, it could be. He is producing a country record. God. Is How Passion Project be playing basketball? <laughs> well, that's his job. Sometimes. <laughs> Is the chosen name Heat Wentz, was it from a number of different choices that well, he had? How did he arrive at so, that as so his name? So Pete Wentz is the bass player and songwriter of Fall Out Boy. So Heat Wentz was the obvious sort of step for being specifically involved in this Fall Out Boy music video. There were so many that came out that day. There were all sorts of different references. Jimmy Butler, Eat World, for example. Um, but yeah, Heat Wentz. I mean, this is, I'm very excited about this. This, I, is, this is my world's colliding in a great way. I suggest to everyone uh, listening to this, just find uh, uh, the video for Too Legit to Quit uh, MC Hammer at the height of his powers when he decided to go get a bunch of athletes to just appear in the video. The video from a different time. Now he's trying, this is Hammer trying to make a second song after hitting super stardom on whatever you think the heights of uh, fame and music are. This video is so over the top dreadful and so over the top 90s and has so many Kirby Puckett and Chris Mullins and Jerry Rice and Deion Sanders and Andre Risen and, and everyone else. How is, oh, thank you, uh, video has already found this video. Just play it here on the screen in front of people so people can see how much money went into this uh, truly terrible 90s video. But what can you tell me, Jeremy, about Fallout Boy's video? How good is the actual video? How many cameos does it have? I I have yet to see uh, the full video. This is breaking. This is breaking. Right As we're recording this, this is just so they're came just out a few they're just ago. teasing the idea that this will be shortly something you can see. Yeah, I mean, I think it's out now on YouTube. Um, but what they posted to Twitter, which was the clip that I saw, was 25 seconds of Jimmy just dancing around in this studded cowboy outfit with the emo hair, which is interesting because why he also is in the cowboy. I'm, I'm intrigued to see sort of the plot line here that goes with uh, this music <laughs> are, are video. You, I really you, am. You think there's going to be would. a tapestry woven you in this would. music video? Yeah, I do think so. It's Look, this Fall is Fall Out, Out Boy, Boy, man. If you don't know the lore of Fall Out Boy and the way that they do their music videos, I mean. Fall Out Boy had one of the most important music video moments of my young childhood when oh, Pete Wentz uh, did the thing where he like strummed the guitar and then he licked his fingers and yep. did like a salute. Yeah. They still do that at concerts. Fall Out Boy performed at the All-Star Game for the Panthers last season mm -hmm. and That's up until it, they were about to start I thought they were some 41 wow. I was thinking the whole time that fallout boy was the guy with the face I was expecting yeah. the guy with the face and I never mm. got the guy with the well, didn't they make like got, everyone knows who I'm talking we about. didn't start the fire yeah remix. they did it was horrible oh my god so it was they, they were I can't like say the you know recent music has been my cup of tea 
No, it's been about a decade since they've made good music. But at least they have Jimmy Butler in their music video now, so they know I'm going to watch. Clutching the straws here, yeah. This allows me to close the show and the postgame show with our own We Didn't Start the Fire, which was all about a variety of pirates. It's one of my favorite ridiculous songs that we've done around here. And I also need to ask you guys before I get out of here, because I wonder if you guys have worn what I'm about to wear metaphorically home, not I'm physically. I'm not wearing that home. Yeah, I'm not wearing the Nacho Libre costume. Metaphorically home, uh, which is the amount of fatigue I have on me because I think I consistently underestimate how tired I get doing the show while wearing the costumes. My face hurts from the mask. Uh, my nipples are like icy frozen shards of uh, it's too cold in here. And I am feeling physically like drained and unpleasant because I've staggered through the two and a half hour, last two and a half hours of the show. I'm wondering if this happens to you guys with the costumes. Is this a universal truth I'm speaking or am I just old? One Abs time I had absolutely. to go home painted green and I couldn't take it off. Six showers later was still on. When I put in all that effort as the waiter at JT's on the river, that was a really long day. Green, green was the color that you had trouble. Have you ever, have you had to paint yourself otherwise? Because when I've painted myself, it's also difficult to get off and it's a different kind of tire, but it hasn't taken me six times to get it off in the shower. No, that was the Hell worst yeah. by far. It was like Hell sprayed yeah. on or something. It was like, Myra, please, let's do less of a good job with this, please, if we can. I'm going to do a bug and say, yeah, our jobs are really hard and we're really yeah. tired afterwards. Tom Brady couldn't do them. Are you ready, Chris Cody? I'm filibustering so that you can find the pirate song. It's uh, it's taking you a second. We could talk more about Fall Out Boy if you want. It's just all about a variety of pirates. Blackbeard, Dale Barron, John McKay, Bill Day, Walk the Plank, I Patch, Vince DiMaggio. Bill Madlock, Jim Fragosi, Connie Mack, Willie Stargell, Lee Mazzilli, Lloyd McClendon, Sixto Lescano. Scurvy, Buried Treasure, Raymond James Stadium, Testa Verde, Keyshawn Johnson, Ken Obergfell, Ed Ott, Dave Parker, Leroy Selman, Chum Bucket, Mike Allstott, Kenton Colby, Richie Zizkrik, Russell and John Gruden. We are scared of pirates. They are all Okay, bye.